Welcome to the Humphrey Metrodome in Minneapolis. Big crowd is gathering. We've got on Sunday night baseball, the Baltimore Orioles and the Minnesota Twins. Hello everyone, John Miller along with Joe Morgan and for baseball purists, baseball indoors, particularly here at the Metrodome, is most offensive. And one thing is for sure, whether you're a purist or not, the Minnesota Twins, and particularly indoors in this ballpark, are very offensive-minded. With Puckett and Herbeck and Gaetti, it's a wild and wide-open kind of baseball in this part, Joe. Well, they've always had good hitters as far as Minnesota Twins are concerned, but the problem with the Minnesota Twins is the other team gets to hit here in the Metrodome as well. And they've really struggled a little bit. They had a great May, but lately they have not been hitting well, and their pitching has been struggling. So you put that together, and you're not going to combine for many wins. Now, Cal Ripken of the Orioles has another streak going, not just the consecutive game streak, but tonight he can set a record for consecutive errorless games. Well, a middle infielder, shortstop, second base, their job is to play defense. Anytime you set defensive records it's very important if you're a middle infielder and I know this is going to be very important to Cal and hopefully Philly for him he's going to reach that goal tonight so maybe we'll see an all-time record here tonight or maybe we'll see the dream shattered we've got the Orioles and the twins on this holiday weekend and we've got a matchup of two former Fordham University pitchers Pete Harnish going against Roy Smith John Miller with Joe Morgan back here at the Metrodome as the Orioles and Twins are about to go at it. Now the Sears diehard starting lineup for the visiting Baltimore Orioles. It'll be Steve Finley leading it off in right field. Tim Hewlett bats second at second base. Randy Milligan been a great surprise this year at first base. Mickey Tettleton the designated hitter. Joe Orsalak is in left field batting fifth. Cal Ripken hitting sixth. He's been down in the order the last couple of weeks. Craig Worthington bats seventh at third base. Bob Melvin is the catcher. And at center field batting ninth, Mike Devereaux. And the defense for the Minnesota Twins will have Gene Larkin in right field. Gold Glove winner Kirby Puckett in center. John Moses is the left fielder. Gary Gaetti, Gold Glove winner, is at third. Greg Gagne is the shortstop. Al Newman plays second base tonight. Kent Herbeck is the first baseman. Brian Harper behind the plate and on the mound right hander Roy Smith. That is Leroy Purdy Smith the third 28 years of age from Mount Vernon New York. What can you tell us about him Joe. Well he has a good fastball and a big curveball. And he's been a very successful pitcher so far this year one of the few guys that has pitched well for the twins. His record doesn't show that but as we've mentioned a lot of times lately they have been struggling offensively as well and they haven't played as good defensively as the twins normally do either. Smith has had the great success against the Orioles last year. He won 10 ball games for the twins all told. He faced the Orioles three times and won three straight games against them. And the first time he faced them this year in this ballpark back on May the 30th, he won that ball game 12 to 3. He got plenty of support from the Twins that night. And that was his fourth victory. He has not won a game since then. So he's looking forward to the Orioles being in town again. The umpiring alignment for the ball game at the Metrodome. Tim Cheetah, who's a native of this area from over in St. Paul, back at the plate, Gary Cedarstrom. A rookie is at first base. Terry Cooney, who is not a rookie at second. And Joe Brinkman, he of the Joe Brinkman Umpire School. Umpiring over third base. He is the crew chief. Steve Finley will lead it off for the Orioles. Talented young left handed hitter. And uh, this Orioles ball club, a club filled with youth. He was one of the, the many young players brought on board last year by manager Frank Robinson, general manager Roland Heeman, as the Orioles made the dramatic transition from a team that had lost 107 games the year before to being a pennant contender until the final weekend of last season one of the great turnarounds of all time. But now the Orioles are having some problems living up to the expectations that that pennant contention last year brought about. Well I think you're hitting the nail on the head John last year no one expected the Orioles to do anything after losing their first 21 ball games the year before. So last year they were relaxed loose at the beginning of the season they played well and Robinson put together a great defensive team last year the outfield especially played great as you know and that was one of the reasons that they did so well. I think this year they were expected to be in the pennant race and they just have not been able to live up to that. One ball one strike to count to Finley. 
could be some trouble. Gagney, the shortstop, racing over, and he's there to get it. Bentley fouls out to the shortstop. Gagney, after a long run, got there, and then he made it look easy at the last. So Finley is retired. You mentioned the fact that it could be trouble. Any ball that goes in the air here in the Metrodome is trouble because the, the Sky Dome's ceiling is light. And you could see that Gagne kept his eye on the ball all the way. Most of the time, you'll look up, find it, and go to that spot. But in the Metrodome, you have to keep your eyes on the ball at all times. Here's the veteran Tim Hewlett. Hewlett was one of those fellows who was uh, taken off the scrap heap of uh, former Major League players by the Orioles last year. And he came on and made a significant contribution in the final month of the season. He takes a call and strike. Hewlett. One time regular player for the White Sox in the early to mid 80s lost his job back into the minor leagues and then the Orioles signed him to a minor league contract last year. They did that kind of thing with a lot of players a blend of veterans cast offs and uh, young talent but unproven talent last year. He went up with a count of two balls and one strike. And the fastball is low three and one the count. Now the Orioles had been struggling. They too did not have a very strong month of June. They started well in June. Then they fell apart for about two and a half weeks. And it's three and two. But the last two nights here at the Metrodome they've come away with victories. And the Twins scored only two runs in those two games combined. Frank Robinson of the Orioles. Tony Oliva. Tom Kelly. The Twins. None of those people can remember seeing the Twins do so little offensively in two games against the Orioles here. Puckett on the run. He's got this one measured. Two men down. When the ball was first hit there, John, it looked like it could be trouble, but when you have Kirby Puckett in center field, he closes the gap on the baseball very quickly, and that became just a routine play. You'd see he's yelling right there, I've got it. He even has to slow down to get it. But the ball was right between the left fielder and the center fielder when it was first hit. This is Randy Milligan. Very interesting player. 270 batting average, but look at that on base average. There's that curveball. One of the curveballs that Smith throws, and it's a called strike. Milligan, who was off to a very slow start this year, but he has really gotten hot in the last month or so. Fouls one back. 0 oh, 2 the count. This guy will take a walk. Managers are always talking about players who are overly aggressive, going up there, swinging at bad balls. Not so with Milligan. One time considered one of the top young prospects in the Mets organization. But they had a first baseman already at the major league level, and there was nowhere for Milligan to go with a guy named Keith Hernandez playing first at Shea Stadium. The Orioles ended up making a deal with Pittsburgh to get him. They're glad to have him. Two and two the count. Milligan in the number three spot in the order, which for the last seven years has belonged almost exclusively to Cal Ripken, as you see Tom Kelly, the Minnesota manager. Milligan will get on base. He's got an excellent eye, and he hits with power. He got 13 home runs, 65 walks. He has walked more often than any major league player. Uh, it's more than twice as anyone except Cal Ripken. That's in the right center field, and that's into the alleyway. Cutting it off is Larkin, the right fielder, and he'll hold Milligan to a single. Milligan did a good job of hitting there. The ball was away and he lined it to right field. And the reason it was a good job of hitting is because Roy Smith had come inside a couple of times with a good fastball and then went away. And a lot of times a player will pull off or try to pull that pitch. Now here is Mickey Tendleton. Tendleton is another fellow who draws a lot of walks. Look at that on base average, 411. Tendleton, 11 home runs, second on the team in home runs. Ball one. They got him from the Oakland Athletics who had released him. And the tail end of the 1988 spring training, Tendlin reported to the minors. The Orioles brought him up after about a month in 1988. He did an excellent job for them. But then last year, talk about blossoming. He hit 26 home runs, made the All Star team. And he would have hit a lot more if he would not have been injured and on the disabled list for quite a while. Two down runner at first and Smith misses low ball two. Now in the Metrodome as you see Tendleton a switch hitter batting left handed with power. This is a left handed pull hitters ballpark. 
right field is a very friendly home run hitters park sort of a reverse image of Fenway Park an indoor version of Fenway and that's a ball three and oh the count they've got a curtain out there in right field so you have to get the ball elevated above that curtain but it is very close to home plate there's a look at it curtain is 23 feet high the ball carries very well in the Metrodome also and also in Seattle the Astrodome is the only place the ball doesn't carry well indoors and it's three and one now to Tettle on deck is Joe Orsillac. The Orioles, we mentioned Milligan with his 65 walks. Tedlin's walked 59 times. You mentioned Cal Ripken with a lot of walks. The Orioles team has drawn more walks than any major league team. Popped him up on three and one. Her bet. He wants it. It's the inning. One hit, one left for the Orioles. Now we'll get a look at the Minnesota Twins from the Metrodome. No score in the game. John Miller and Joe Morgan back at the Metrodome. The Twins coming up. Let's take a look at the Sears diehard batting order for the Minnesota Twins. Albert D. Newman leads off at second base. Gene Larkin in right field. They're both switch hitters. Kirby Puckett in center field. Can't hurt back. This ballpark was invented for him. Gary Gaetti bats fifth. Brian Harper was really found a home here and Blossom. He's hitting sixth. Paul Sorrento, the designated hitter. Young player up in the minors, John Moses in left field. Greg Gagney bats ninth at shortstop. And the defense will have Steve Finley in right field. Mike Devereaux is the center fielder. Joe Orsalak is in left field. Craig Worthington is at third base. Cal Ripken Jr. is the shortstop. Tim Hewlett, Hewlett is the second baseman. Randy Milligan is at first. Bob Melvin is behind the plate. And on the mound, right-hander Pete Harnish. And Harnish lost his last outing as you can see seven and four in the season he lost to the Cleveland Indians in his last outing he pitched eight innings gave up six hits and five runs four of them were earned and you look at his base on balls to strikeouts and you see why he does have some problems sometimes That's 41 walks to 58 strikeouts Friday night at the series began here at the Metrodome. The Orioles a winner there, six to two, with a four-run seventh inning coming from behind. Dave Johnson over the really struggling Allen Anderson. Anderson 17 wins last year. He's only 2 and 11 this year. The Orioles also a winner last night, six to nothing, back at Bob Malaki, who pitched a three-hit shutout here. Here's Newman. He's a switch hitter, utility type player. He plays all over. He's got excellent speed, can steal bases. And there's a foul off to the left and out of play. And here's what happened last night. Malaki with his finest performance of the season. And if you pitch a three hit shutout in this ballpark against the Twins, you have pitched awfully well. Erickson, a rookie, was the loser. One ball, one strike. Harnish will have control difficulties from time to time. But Joe, he's one of those bulldog kind of pitchers. The, the more trouble he's in, the better he seems to pitch. Tried to kick that one, but he couldn't. Base hit. Last week in our ball game, remember, Dibble, Rob Dibble kicked the ball and they went to shortstop. You see Cal Ripken Jr. getting a jump on the ball, but it's hit too sharply and it's hit right up the middle. He was shading Newman a little bit toward left field. Marnish tried to. Like he was playing like Eddie Jackman, the old New York Rangers a goaltender. That's where Harnish is from. He's from the New York area out of Fordham University. 1987, he was 8 and 1 at Fordham and led them into the NCAA regional tournament where he pitched against a very fine University of Georgia ball club. We're talking three years ago now. He threw 179 pitches in a game and beat Georgia. Down the right field line, this is Orsalak. He's got a chance to double up Newman. Here's the throw. Milligan has to come off the bag. The hurried throw from Orsalak pulling Milligan off the bag, and Newman is back safely. Larkin retired. Newman thought the ball was in all the way. He probably did not check the outfield as he should have before the ball was hit. But you can see here, it's not even a tough play for Finley, and he winds up. If his throw is accurate to first base and Milligan can stay on the bag, Newman is doubled off. 
And that was Steve Finley. Not Joe Orsalak. Orsalak usually plays right field for the Orioles, but here in the Metrodome, they have made the, the shift with Orsalak going to left field and Finley in right field. Finley ordinarily with a very strong and accurate arm. Here's Kirby Puckett. Kirby has been struggling, as have all of the twins. The thing that they're most amazed about here, you got one out, one on, is that not only is Puckett slumping, but so is Herbeck and so is Gaetti. And Tony Oliva, the hitting coach and manager Tom Kelly, they cannot recall a time when all three of them were in a slump together for such a long period of time. Well, you could see per Kirby's numbers there, 270, and then three up to up to 342, and now he's back to hitting two over 250 here in June. So he's really been struggling the first month and the third month. Had a good second month. We talk about struggling though, and the guy's hitting 300. <laughs> That says a lot for you when you're struggling. Newman at first with one out. Now Harnish has not been very adept at holding on base runners. In fact, most of the Orioles pitchers have been easy against which to run. Harnish tried that slide step there to hurry the ball to the plate, but he missed with the pitch. Ball one. No score in the game. Kirby Puckett. You know you got. You've got a great ball player out there when people are saying, What's wrong with him? And he's hitting 302 with 10 home runs and 43 RBIs. Kirby Puckett, one of the great players in the game, one of the great guys in the game. That's foul and out of play. You say to Kirby Puckett, Kirby, how you doing? He said, I woke up this morning and I was breathing, so it's a great day. He <laughs> says, That's 99% of it right there. The other 1% of it is being out of here playing ball. That's 100%. Well, he is a has a great attitude about the way to play the game. He comes to play hard every single night, and he misses very few ball games. A ball and a strike. Fouled off the catcher, Bob Melvin. One ball and two strikes. Pete Harnish on the mound. Talking about that game in college. 179 pitches. He won the game against Georgia five to two. He walked nine, and he gave up 11 hits. Struck out eight and won the ball game. Chris Carpenter, who's with the Cardinals, uh, Derek Lilliquist with Atlanta, Steve Carter's with Cleveland, all were on that Georgia ball club. So here's Harnish. He's only 23 years of age. He struck out Puckett, who chased a bad ball. Well, the thing that Harnish did so well there is he stayed inside on Puckett, which gets Puckett looking for the ball inside. Now he throws it high and in, up and in. This is the toughest pitch for anybody to hit. You just can't hit that ball. You may foul it off, but you're not going to do anything with it. Usually a guy like Puckett who hits around 330, 340 does not swing at that pitch. And uh, Puckett, I, I guess, was not swinging at it when he was hitting 340. No. It's you're one probably of the, right. One of the reasons he's been falling. He's been swinging pitches like that throughout this series. Newman still at first, two men down, and he's back to the bag. Can't her back the hitter. Gigantic hulking figure at the plate. In an interesting stance, he's always tinkering with his stances. Keep it away from him. Strike one. Herbeck has been the only Twins hitter who's really hit well in this series. He's had three doubles and a home run in the first two ball games of the series. They say this ballpark was made for Herbeck, and yes, they do. They love Kent here. He's from the area. Grew up a Twins fan. That right field porch is so reachable for him. Not that he needs any help as strong as he is. There goes Newman. Melvin's throw. He's in with a steal. Melvin took a little longer to get rid of the ball than he should have. Therefore, he didn't have any chance. That's a pretty good jump. He didn't have a great jump, and Melvin caught the ball high in the strike zone, which gives you a good shot, but it took him a little longer to get rid of the ball. And there's Ripken covering. You have to think every time Ripken takes a play or takes a throw, there's a risk of him making an error and having his consecutive errorless game streak stopped. If he does not commit an error tonight, we mentioned this at the outset, but we'll try and firmly establish it. If he goes throughout the game with no errors, he will own the all time record for a single season consecutive games by a shortstop without an error. 
Little dribbler. Hewlett to Milligan. Her back retired and down go the twins. And uh, you've seen what the folks here in Minnesota have been saying. Twins not swinging the bats well. Lots of baseball coming up this week on ESPN as in every other week. No score here. This is John Miller along with Joe Morgan at the Metrodome. Joe, a lot of no hitters this weekend. Three no hitters. Andy Hawkins pitched one today. What do you make of all of that? Well, it makes me look kind of bad. I said that the pitching has been a little down this year, and I really believe that the top half of the staffs are still great. But when you drop to the bottom half, the bottom four or five pitchers on the staff, you have problems. And the top half of the guys are the ones that are pitching no hitters. <laughs> This is Joe Orsalak with a swinging strike one. One strike to count. Orsalak will be followed by Cal Ripken and Craig Worthington. No score in the game as we play the second inning. Orsalak has led the Orioles in hitting in each of the last two years, and he is leading the ball club in hitting right now. Curveball, and there's a base hit. Orsalak, a very unorthodox looking hitter up there. But he gets it done. So far, Roy Smith has thrown a lot of slow curveballs, not hard curveballs. And this is a slow curveball, and Orsalak just waits on it. Watch, he gets out front a little bit right there. Now he waits, and he pulls the ball in the hole. Nice piece of hitting by Orsalak. He waited on the ball very well. One of the things you do is you drag your back foot, and that lets you take the bat level through the hitting zone for a split second longer. Stay back on the back foot, your swing starts up and becomes an uppercut. Here's Cal Ripken. You see that batting average, 251. He's hitting sixth in the order. There's a strike. Since he was dropped from the number three spot down to the sixth spot, that average has gone up more than 40 points. He's still not hitting the ball well for power, but he is getting some base hits now. Watching him right now, this at bat, from what I've seen in the last few months. He is in a better hitting position right now John because he is not hitting from as close to stance as he was before and as from as far away from the plate where he had to dive into the ball. He squared off a little bit with his feet that lets you whip the bat through the strike zone a lot easier and I think you're going to see him start to hit for more power pretty soon. So that's a more of a square stance there for Tom, for Cal Ripken than he had been before. That fastball's in there for a strike. It is 0 and 2. Now, Cal Ripken had been way to the right rear of the batter's box, right there where his right foot was. He had been that far away and diving into the plate. Now he's moved closer to the plate, and you can see his feet are almost square. Still a slightly closed stance, but before it was exaggeratedly closed. There's the breaking ball outside. One and two the count. Nobody out runner at first. We're in the second inning. No score in the game. Roy Smith. Trying to help the Twins get the month of July started out nicely. They won seven games and lost 21 in June after going 21 and 7 in May. Diane bobbles it. Still in time to get Orsalak at second. Throw taken by Newman. Ripken is safe at first. If Gaetti would have come up with this cleanly, they could have turned the double play, but he stays right with it. Whips it very quickly over to Newman, and they get the force out on Oslock, but no chance to get Ripken at first base. Gary Gaetti, he does not often no. have problems like that. Gold Glove winner, he's the finest defensive third baseman in the American League. So with one out, Cal Ripken's at first. Here's Craig Worthington, one of the top rookies in the league last year. Takes a called strike, a fastball, but he has really struggled this year. He's hit well against Smith the few times he's faced him. Worthington last year hit for a low average but was driving in runs. That one is away from Harper and over to second base goes Cal Ripken. It is scored as a wild pitch. A guy that throws a br big breaking curveball will get a lot of wild pitches unless his catcher is able to block the ball and keep it in front. See this is a slider that breaks low and away. You can see that Harper tried to get in front of it with not a lot he could do. So he's trying to get over with his body. And it hits off his right shoulder and bounds away because the spin was going that way as well. It made it impossible for him to keep it in front of him. 
comes right back with another breaking ball. Two and one. Cal Ripken talking about Smith and why he's had great success against the Orioles. And Cal says that he's a very smart pitcher and he changes speeds and he changes speeds on his breaking ball. It really keeps you off balance. Three and one. Well, the art of pitching is keeping the hitter off balance. Whether you do that by with a 90 mile an hour fastball inside and then go away, or whether you do that with an 85 mile an hour fastball and then come with an 80 mile an hour changeup. As long as you change speeds and throw strikes, you will be successful as a pitcher. There is a runner in scoring position. Worthington fouls it back three and two. The graphic we saw a moment ago says it all about where Worthington is this year. He's not hitting in any situation this year for the most part. Last year, he hit over 300 with men in scoring position all season long. He was excellent in the clutch. There's Cal at second. One out, no scores, second inning. That's a pop up. And Newman, the second baseman, wants it. Looking up into the dome. Out number two. Ripken holds it second. When there's a ball in the air in this ballpark, you cannot take your eyes off it, Joe. How, what's the best way to go after it when that ball's up there? Well, you have to keep your eyes on it from the time it leaves the bat. But the problem is, as you can see, it's a light-colored ceiling, and the baseball is light-colored. Even when they rub it down, there's still some white on it. So you got a white background and a white baseball. That makes it tough to pick up the baseball. Here's Bob Melvin, veteran catcher, batting 236. Foul tips one. No score, two down, runner at second. Kirby Puckett lost one in the dome here Friday night. And he said it was maybe the fourth or fifth ball that he's ever lost in the dome here. None of the Orioles had ever seen him lose one. They had the same problem in the Astrodome when it first started. When they first built the Astrodome, they first started to play there. It was tough to pick up the baseball against the light background. It's a called strike. It is 0 and 2. Bob Melvin, who has hit extremely well on the road and hit almost nothing at all at home this year. Look at that. <laughs> That's not the way it's supposed to be. Well, thank goodness he's on the road, he says. <laughs> strike three called. He got him looking. So the Orioles get a leadoff hit by Orsalak, but nothing more. One man left. At the end of one and a half innings, there is no score. No score in the game here at the Metrodome, the Orioles and the Twins. John Miller with Joe Morgan. And Joe, let's go back to that Orioles second inning for just a moment. Well, it was a good job of pitching by Roy Smith. After the first guy got the base hit, he pitched Bob Melvin inside with a couple of fastballs for a strike. And then he went away for the strikeout. See? Harper set up right on the outside corner and he hits the glove. Perfect pitch. Not anything Melvin can do with that. Here is Gary Gaetti to lead it off for the Twins. Last of the second. No score in the game. And Harnish throws in the fastball up and in. Fouled back to the screen by Gaetti. Gary Gaetti. He's been a big run producer for the Twins. Gold glove third baseman, a team leader. Hard nosed player. Very involved in the community. And the change up, strike two. That's a good pitch right there. You throw a good fastball, and the guy's a little late on it, so he figures you may want to come back with a fastball, and he has to get it the bat through the zone a little quicker, and you take something off the pitch, and he's dead. And it's a ball. With Pete Harnish, the Orioles are doing something at the big league level that maybe other organizations in fact the Orioles organization in years past would have done at the minor league level he's learning on the job into the hole Ripken's got a long throw here and he just did get it first base umpire Cedarstrom making the call you know we talked about Ripken in the 72 game consecutive early streak it starts to play on your mind about this time when you watch Ripken here watch him take a little extra time to get himself ready right there to make sure that he makes an accurate throw. Good play. But you can see him take just a little extra time right now he would try to get rid of the ball normally. 
but he takes an extra pad of the glove and sets himself properly and makes a good throw. There's a strike to Brian Harper. Look at that batting average, 304, and I'm sure around the country people are saying, well, who is he? Well, Brian Harper's been with some other organizations. He's been cast off. Tom Kelly seemed to find just the right spot for him. This is Devereaux in center field. Out number two. Harper is promptly retired. He's a Brian Harper fan right there. Brian came here. He was made a role player. And Kelly feels that the important thing for him, Joe, is not to overuse him. Get him in there against certain pitchers, not against others. And he's become a, a real solid 300 hitter. I think if a manager takes a little time and looks at all of his players, especially the guys who are not stars, and figures out what they hit best, fastball, curveball, or whatever, and use them against those types of pitchers, they would have more success. Here is Paul Sorrento. But the problem is managers get caught up in the situation because players want to play every day against all types of pitching, and some hitters are just not capable of handling certain certain pitches. Left center field, Orsalak on the run. He's not going to get to it. Sorrento will stop at second with a stand-up double. Rookie just up for the minors recently. And Sorrento gets his second double of the year. With a fastball out over the plate. And he drove it in the gap in the left center field. Hit it real hard. It's right out over the plate. He stays back real well here. Now he drives right through the ball. He has an uppercut in his swing, so he's going to hit a hot, lot of fly balls. And a left-handed fly ball hitter will work well here in the Astrodome. I mean, in the Metrodome. There's John Moses. He's hitting 239. Another role player. He's a switch hitter. He runs well. Can steal a base for you. Can play all around the outfield and play first base. Well, they were checking to see if Sorrento missed first base on his way to second for the double, and Cedarstrom says no, he did not miss first base. So we'll resume play. Very rarely is that play called anyway. Most of the time, the guy catches one part of the bag, and you're looking from a distance if you're an infielder, and you think he may have missed it, but the umpires are right on top of those plays. Two down, runner at second. It's a foul off to the left. Look out into the crowd in a hurry. Oh, and won the count. Sorrento, by the way, the man who just hit the double, came to the Twins from the California Angels organization in the deal that sent Burt Blylevin out there a couple of years back. He hit 27 home runs last year in double A ball. Came up in September but did not play well. But they think that he's going to be a, a very fine big league hitter. He's got one home run already. Just played in a handful of games. Moses, the eighth place hitter in the order, takes a ball. One ball, one strike. Well, as I mentioned, he's a back leg hitter, which means you're staying back so that when your bat comes through the zone, it has a little uppercut in it. So he's going to hit a lot of fly balls. And that goes with the fact that he hit 27 home runs last year. That means he does lift the ball. Moses, meanwhile, has not been hitting the ball much regardless of the style the pitch is high for a ball two and one Pete Harnish got a very strong arm throws hard doesn't throw Nolan Ryan hard but he's up around 90 good slider he's still trying to perfect his change up and he doesn't like you if you're on the other team <laughs> Two and one the count to John Moses. Two down. That's foul and out of play. Two balls, two strikes. They're playing very shallow in left field. But the out the center field and the right field, they're in pretty much normal position, but the left fielder is playing in very, very tight. Orsalak is playing like he's a pop-up hitter. You know, you mentioned that. He wouldn't like me if I was on the other team. I wouldn't like him either, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the way it should be. <laughs> exactly. Time taken by Moses at the plate. Gagney, the ninth place hitter, is on deck. He would be next. There's that barrier between pitchers and hitters. Even on your own team, <laughs> you're not always fond of each other. 2-2 pitch. And it's 3-2. 
fact, I remember Sparky Anderson. He didn't like the pitchers on his own team <laughs> when we played at Cincinnati. Pitchers swore him down that he hated them. Well, the pitching staff is sort of a team unto itself in a way, isn't it? Yes, it is. They are pitchers think differently than any other player on the field. Harness with seven wins, four losses, tied for the team lead in victories. He's been the best of the starting pitchers for the Orioles this year. He got him swinging with an off speed delivery. And so Harnish gets out of the little jam, a two out double by Soretto. He is stranded. No score after two. On July 1st, 1941, the Yankee Clipper, Joe DiMaggio, hit safely in his 44th consecutive game, tying Wee Willie Keeler's Major League record, which had stood for 43 summers. The next day, DiMaggio would smash this record en route to his legendary 56-game hitting streak. Joe DiMaggio. And uh, we're back in 1990 now at the Metrodome. A ballpark like none that was in existence in the time of DiMaggio. And it's Mike Devereaux, the ninth place hitter for the Orioles, takes ball one from Roy Smith. This is John Miller along with Joe Morgan, your Sunday night telecasters. We'll be with you again next Sunday night just before the All-Star break from Cleveland as the Indians take on the world champion Oakland Athletics. Cal Ripken, the uh, last uh, voting I saw, was leading the way at shortstop in the American League. And he's obviously closing in on two other records, one tonight for fielding, and the other, he's trying to get close to Lou Gehrig, but he's got five years to go <laughs> to get to you, Lou Gehrig. And it's a called strike to Devereaux. I was sitting here looking at the dimensions here and looking at the ballpark, and I said to myself, what would Harmon Killebrew and Bob Allison do in a ballpark like this? I really... It would be tough to think about how many home runs Killebrew would have hit in the Metrodome. Well, he hit uh, plenty in uh, the other ballparks yeah. in which he played. The old Met Stadium out in Bloomington. And, of course, had a double deck left field grandstand, and Killebrew hit some in the upper deck out there. There's a pop up, and a Herbeck looking up into the dome and on the move. Harper there, but a Herbeck wants it. What Herbie wants, Herbie gets. One down in the third. No score in the game from the Metrodome. Now, a final in from the Kingdome in Seattle. The Mariners win it 6-5. to five. They score the winning run on a bases-loaded walk to Matt Sinatro from Milwaukee reliever Tom Eatons. And the Dodgers were ahead 5-2 to two in the middle innings, but St. Louis came back to defeat Tommy Lasorda's crew 6-5. to five. Here's Steve Finley, the Orioles' leadoff hitter. He fouled out to short his first time. Bluffing the bunt, taking ball one on that breaking ball from Roy Smith. Well, now, Joe, you know, in this ballpark, this Metrodome, you're talking about the ball carrying well. When, if, when the place first opened, it was a much, much different part than it is now. It's foul right back toward Joe Morgan. The dimensions are the same as they were then. 343 down the left field line, 385 to left center, 408 to straightaway center. 367 out into right center, 327 down the line. What's changed is the height of the fences out there. That's one thing. There's a called strike, one and two the count. But also, they installed air conditioning in here. In 1982, there was none. A day like today, where it was 90 degrees outside, you'd come in here, it would be 87, 88 in here with no wind blowing. That's a liner. Base hit right in front of John Moses. That's the third hit for the Orioles. But the ball flew out of here. The fences were only seven feet high all the way around. And uh, now you've got the big curtain out in right field. You've got a plexiglass fence that goes up above the wall in left field. Probably can't see it on the screen. The, the glass is uh, invisible in effect. But right now it's about 70 degrees in here. The ball doesn't carry as well in the, in the cool atmosphere. There's that plexiglass in left field. Gary Gaetti tells me. If you hit a home run to left center, in particular, from left center over to straightaway center, you have to crush it. Right field, however, is a different story. Well, I heard you say Gaetti said that. Tell you what, I played here, John. The ball carries well here. 
this is a small ballpark compared to say the Oakland Coliseum or the Kansas City ballpark Royal Stadium. This is a small ballpark and uh, guys that play in these ballparks always tell you it's not that easy to hit home runs out of there but it is it's like Wrigley Field people say it's not easy to hit home runs out of there the guys that play there but it is a small ballpark and so is Wrigley Field in Chicago but the ball still carries well here and not only that the infield this AstroTurf is hard the ball shoots through the infield so it's a very good hitters ballpark and that's one of the reasons over the years that they have hit so well here you know I mean this ballpark I would venture a guess without even looking at statistics to say that over the years they've hit more home runs in this ballpark and hit for higher averages. Well what what Gaetti is saying is that they hit well here right. He likes to hit here right you see the background behind us there's a throw to first the background as we saw that last shot of Roy Smith on the mound he says it's a great hitters background. And uh, the ball does shoot through the, uh, the the gaps here. The outfielders are very unaggressive going after balls uh, that they might go for in other ballparks that will fall in. But he says, in terms of home runs, the Twins hit no more home runs here than they hit on the road. And the statistics actually back that up at home this year. Well, this year's an off year, though. Well, but it's 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 not that much different from other years. That the numbers that they hit and give up here. Are almost identical to what they do on the road. Runner going, the ball has popped up. And Herbeck wants this one. He's got it. So Tim Hewlett fouls out the first, two down. Well, I've heard other players like Jose Canseco say if he played in a place like this, he'd hit 60 home runs. And a lot of the other players say that they love to hit here. And I know I played here a few games, and it is a good hitter's ballpark. So you There's see the home the, the batting average and the runs scored and nobody in the twins disputes that they only dispute home run hitting here. Herbeck doesn't because right field is a different story. It's just very shallow. This is Randy Milligan who's been the Orioles biggest offensive star this year. He takes ball one. I remember going into Chicago when I first came into the major leagues and Ernie Banks saying the ball doesn't fly out of Wrigley Field. This is just a good place to play baseball. And the balls fly out of Wrigley Field. Of course, Ernie hit what 60% of his home runs at Wrigley Field. But the ball flies out of there. I know that. Two down runner at first. No score. We're in the third inning. And that's a ball. Two and oh the count. Twins have hit 27 home runs here this year. 37 games and they've hit 29 home runs on the road in 38 games. And I see what you're saying. You're saying, yeah. hey, that's this year. Right. But since they changed the air conditioning, their contention is that that's an average year. There's a nice play by Gagne to get Milligan. The Orioles are gone. One hit, one left. No score after two and a half. As they look at the Capitol building in St. Paul and we are in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis in St. Paul. What a beautiful area of the country. Right alongside the Big Muddy the Mississippi River. Tonight the last night to cast your ballot. For the all star balloting for 1990. I've been meaning to ask you Joe for, to give me your all star team for the year now that the balloting is just about all closed. Well I, give me a ballot and I'll fill one out here. <laughs> Somebody get Joe a ballot will you. This is Greg Gagne the ninth place hitter. For the Minnesota Twins. Hitting 233 he's been struggling at the plate. Yeah, Pete Harnish misses ball one. Gagne had a good year last year hit 272. For the season and hit nine home runs he did it. Very well offensively, and they did a great job defensively, also. No score in this game. We're in the last of the third inning. The Metrodome not living up to its billing here today. The Twins have been struggling. And Roy Smith has been shutting down the Orioles, as he usually does. It's Tom Kelly, the manager. Sitting in the dark in the corner of the dugout. Here's Finley on the move, and he makes the catch. Hit a sliding grab out there. Might have gotten some turf burn on that right knee. John, that was a great catch. Not because he had to slide to get it, but he got a great jump on the ball as well. He was off with the crack of the bat, and that's the only reason he could make that play. 
If he would have hesitated at all, the ball would have fell in for a base hit. And at this ballpark, if it falls in front of him there, right. the ball's going to roll for a long, long time. To the top of the order we go. Here's Al Newman, the leadoff hitter. Strike one. There's a look at the right knee of Finley. What do you think? You think he? Uh, well, it looks like he was smart enough to have a knee pad underneath that just wore through the pants. It didn't do any damage to his knees. Well, I hope so. A lot of outfielders that play AstroTurf wear knee pads and knee guards to protect themselves from those types of uh, burns. Finley is truly a gifted outfielder. He does get an excellent jump on the ball. He's got outstanding speed. Very young and still learning how to play, though. Harness is too high. Two balls, one strike. Larkin is on deck. The Twins, when they faced Harnish here back on May the 30th, it was Harnish's worst outing of the year. They knocked him out by the fourth inning. That's foul and out of play. Off to the left. A lot of foul territory in this ballpark, as you see there. Harnish gave up six runs in three innings that night and lost to Roy Smith. The Twins were right up near the top of the division at that time. They were finishing up the month of May with a flourish. But almost since that time, they've gone exactly the other way. 2 2 pitch. The breaking ball just misses. 3 and 2. Oakland lost today to the Toronto Blue Jays, 4 to 3. Toronto snapping a six game losing streak. And the White Sox won, although they got no hit. This is more and more looking like maybe the White Sox are going to make a run for it this year. No hits and they win by four. This is Finley's play. See how he comes in, keeps his eyes on the ball all the way. Now he slides on his right knee and the AstroTurf just burns that uniform away. But you can see right there he has a knee pad on. So it protected him from having his knee burned as well as his uniform. Now here's Gene Larkin. One out, Newman at first. Harnish with his first walk of the game. And Larkin looks at a called strike. Wednesday, the 4th of July, uh, Joe and I will be here as the Boston Red Sox atop the American League East play here at the Metrodome. A special holiday Major League Baseball matinee for you. That day, the 4th of July, of course, the anniversary of the famous Luke Gehrig Day at Yankee Stadium. Finley yeah. going back on one. And he's got this one. Not number two. Larkin from Columbia University. As was Lou Gehrig. Broke all of Gehrig's home run records at Columbia. A little short on that one though. Yeah. But Finley again got a good jump on the ball. And he made the play look very easy. This is Kirby Puckett now. Kirby has not had a hit nor has he reached base in this series. Kirby very unusual to see that happen to him in this ballpark last year he hit 390 in here and that's about an average year for him in this ballpark two down and nobody on fuck a 320 lifetime hitter against the Orioles the last time they were in here he hit two home runs against them and beat them in the late innings with a three run home run. and he has gone 0 for 8 in this series. We're in the last of the third. It's Minnesota nothing, the Orioles nothing. Pitchers duel here at the Metrodome. Kirby Puckett at the plate with Newman at first. Newman stole second his first time. That's a base hit for Puckett. Newman will go to second as Orsalak is up with the ball. And the table is set for the big slugger, Kent Herbeck. Kirby Puckett finally gets himself a base hit in this series. Well, the thing that Puckett does so well is he really drops the barrel of the ball, bat on the ball. And he keeps the ball on the ground. He doesn't hit this ball in the air. See how he just drops the barrel right on the bat ball. And he hits a lot of ground balls through the infield here. And that's why he's able to hit close to 400. If you hit the ball in the air, you're not going to hit 400. Can't her back. Trying to shake himself out of a slump. He had a terrible month of June. Interesting stance, Joe. What do you make of that stance? Well, Herbeck changes stances very frequently. <laughs> Just depends on how he's swinging the bat. And since he's not swinging the bat so well, 
he hadn't been anyway he changed again and he's hitting from an open stance a lot of guys feel like from the open stance you can see the pitcher better you can see the ball come out of his hand better uh, I'm not one that subscribes to that theory but a lot of people believe that and if it works for them that's what they should do he took a mighty cut one ball one strike the way he's bent over there well the only problem with that John is he's got a lot of movement here watch how much movement before he actually swings at the ball he turns his shoulder in he steps in all that movement causes head movement as well and it's tough to keep your eyes focused on the baseball you're supposed to have as little amount of head movement as possible slider misses ball two. the great hitters of all time they had the great couple of things in common their head did not move very much and they always had a stride that was shorter than their original stance. You think this is symptomatic of the fact that he's been slumping maybe some of the reasons. Well I think he's point? trying something new but hitting is psychological. If you feel good in the stance you feel like you can hit from that stance you may have success. Two one pitch he was behind that one. There's Newman at second base. And uh, over at first is Kirby Puckett. Two down, both ready to go in anything. But the point is, the more movement you have in your body before you start your swing, the more problems you can create for yourself. If everything's going right, you can hit standing on your head. But when you're having problems, you have to go back to basics, and that is keep the head still and keep the stride short. Well, Herbeck keeps slumping. He may try that one next. <laughs> this one's in the dirt. Ball three, three and two. Ken Herbeck, who grew up not far from the old Metropolitan Stadium, this winter looked for a while like he might go to the Detroit Tigers. But nobody who knew him, I think, ever really believed that he'd leave here. He loves it here. Newman at second, Puckett at first. Both run very well. There they go. The pitch. And he walked it. So Harnish has loaded the bases for Gary Gaetti. Well, Harnish does not want to give in to Herbig, so he throws him a breaking ball, and it's in the dirt. It's ball four. And here's Gary Gaetti. He grounded a short his first time. Gaetti. This is his spot. This is what they pay him for, the RBI spot. That's always when he's been at his very best. Pete Harnish in a whole lot of trouble. Strike. Got that low strike zone, it looks like, with Tim Cheetah back at the plate today. Well, Gaetti is very upset because he thought the pitch was low. And what you want to do in this situation is make sure you get a good pitch to hit. And the best way to do that is if the pitcher misses with the first pitch, then you narrow your strike zone. You make the pitcher have to come to you. But with one strike, now you have to attack the pitcher. Base is loaded. Two down. The pitch on the way. Well, trying to murder it. Oh, and two. Well, that first strike also gave Harnish the luxury of being ahead in the count. He could throw him the curveball in that situation. If he would have missed with the first pitch and gone one and oh, he would not have been able to throw him the curveball because if he gets behind two and oh, he's really going to be in trouble. So I think the first pitch is always very important if a guy is hitting with the bases loaded. Now it's two strikes to Gaetti. Harnish to the plate. Just missing. Well, he tried to exploit that low strike zone. This time, it was too low. Maybe a little bit outside. Well, I think well. the ball moved back over the plate, but it was low. And that's the pitch that he used for a strikeout earlier. Started it over the outside, just off the outside corner, and moved back onto the outside corner for strike three. Here's the one-two pitch on the way. Slider, a check swing by Gaetti. Nice save by Melvin, the ball in the dirt. Frank Robinson, the great Hall of Famer. Trying to muster some patience with his oh so young ball club, particularly that man, Pete Harnish, 23 years of age. I think this is a pitch that he has to throw for a strike or at least get guided to go after because you do not want to go three and two at the bases loaded and put the runners in motion. Bases loaded, two down, no score. The pitch. That's a slow bouncer. Worthington right next to the bag. Steps on third. Puckett is forced. And Harnish gets out of trouble. The troubles continue, however, for the Minnesota Twins. After three, no score.
Life Budweiser. Beachwood Age for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. By Goodyear Eagle Radials, the best-selling performance radials in the world. And by Minolta, leaders in business equipment for over 25 years. That's a big sandcastle being built right now. I mean, a big sandcastle? That uh, looks like it's twice the size of the state capitol building there. I don't think so, really, but that's all part of the big celebration going on over in St. Paul called the Taste of Minnesota. We're getting a taste of big league baseball indoors at the Metrodome as Mickey Tantleton, the Orioles cleanup hitter, takes ball one from Roy Smith. John Miller, Joe Morgan with you. That's a foul that will go back out of play off to the left. One ball and one strike to Tendleton, who fouled out to first in the first. Now, the Orioles, having won the first two ball games here, there's some ESPN fans. Those fellows will be tuned in next Sunday night, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central. We'll be in Cleveland at the big old ballpark on the shores of Lake Erie, the world champion athletics and the Cleveland Indians. And we're with you every Sunday night, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 Central, 5 Pacific. Sunday night baseball. We visit all the ballparks one time. This is our visit to the Metrodome. We we're talking about Herbeck. Liner in the right field. And one bounce to Larkin. The first hit of the game for Tendleton. This is Tendleton's stance. He's straight up. We talked about Herbeck being bent over. Tendleton starts almost straight up. Now he strides into the ball, but he keeps his head pretty still. Especially on that swing, and he lines it to right field for a base hit. It's another interesting looking stance there, the one utilized by Tendleton. Well, it, it, truthfully, right in between those two is a great stance. <laughs> so Tendleton is too straight up, I believe, and, and Herbeck has been over a little too much at this time. Also, like showing Bud, he decided not to, but the ball was in for a strike. On one. Let me explain that a little bit. What happens when you bend over a lot? And you move your first movement is up which brings your head up It's to straighten your body up if you stand straight up and you land on a stiff leg that jars your head and it also causes movement. So right in between that is where the perfect stance is if you look at a guy like a Stan Musial or Ted Williams they were in a little crouch but not a deep one and they use their legs well Rod Carew all the great hitters have that in common. Tendleton at first, nobody out. We're in the fourth inning, no score in the game. Just off the outside is Roy Smith. One and two to Orsalak. Now he's got an interesting, sort of unorthodox look to him at the plate, Joe. I mean, his feet are moving all over the place when he swings. Got him swinging. And there's one away. That fastball right past Orsalak. Well, it was a real good fastball, and it's away and it's moving away. It's right out toward the outside corner and moves out there. And Orsalak was just a little late on it. He actually, his feet doesn't matter because he's already swung through the pitch by the time his back leg moves. See, what happens after you make contact with the ball is not nearly as important as the things you do before you start your swing. Is Cal Ripken with one out, runner at first, and he takes ball one. Cal hit into a force play his first time. So maybe it's deceiving when you're yes, watching live is. with Orsalak. Looks like he's all over, but well, there we saw that he's not really. No, he's not, and you can't be moving your back foot and swinging a bat because obviously you don't have any balance there. What happens, as I said before, is when you drag your back foot through the swing, that lets you stay on that level plane a little longer. There's that slow curveball from Smith, and he missed with it. Ball two to Cal Ripken. You see Cal's average year since his rookie year of 1982. Not bad totals, especially for a shortstop. Again, I try to stress that the important thing for a middle infielder is to play defense. That's out of play. Foul ball. Sometimes we get spoiled thinking that middle infielders are supposed to hit 300 or hit 25 home runs. But the real job of a shortstop is to make all the plays defensively. The real job of a second baseman is to make the double play and make the plays in the field. And that's what you look for first in your shortstop and second baseman. You have to be strong defensively. Now what you add as a hitter makes you either a good player or a great player or just an average player. And of course Cal Ripken brings great offensive statistics with him. And breaking ball misses three and one. What would you say to those who say well. 
Cal should move to third base not so many aspects of the defensive game to have to worry about which may detract from his from his offensive game. Well I don't think that is probably the case now at first it may have been but I think he's so comfortable playing shortstop now it's like set second nature to him. I don't think he has to think about playing shortstop anymore. Everything is now just reaction. But of that rising fastball fouled it back. But I think if you move him to third base now he has to start to think all over again. He has to think about playing third base. He's not going to react anymore. Um, this is you know some of the things that people are alarmed about is his batting average has dropped from 311 to 257. You know talking to Frank Robinson talking to other players they don't really believe it's because of the consecutive game streak. They believe that maybe his mechanics have not. There goes Tendall and the Cal lines it into left center field. Bucket on the run. He's going to have to play it on the bounce. Holding it second is Tendall. And Tendall was running on that one, but he stopped thinking that Puckett might catch it. And I think Kirby deked him into thinking so. Well, the thing that makes Kirby Puckett great is that he knows what to do on every situation. He knows he's not going to be able to catch this ball in the air, but he keeps it in front of him. But not only that. He decoys the out the, the base runner into thinking that he has a chance to catch the ball and even though he was running he has to hold up because Kirby may be able to make the catch. But that only a great center fielder can do that because that's a tough play to be able to short hop that ball on the run. Now with two men on here is Craig Worthington. That's a foul ball. One strike to count. So what you're saying getting back to Cal Ripken. Right. The, the notion of all of the things that a shortstop has to worry about and right. he's in every pitch of every game right having to almost be like a manager out there doesn't shouldn't detract from his hitting. Well the problem is it does detract from his hitting but let me explain that a little better here. One strike pitch curveball. It's a fly ball medium deep center. Tendlin is tagging at second. Here's the catch by Puckett and Tendlin is not going to challenge it. Gagney cuts it off. Well again you see what Puckett does he gets himself in a position where he's moving towards the ball and toward the infield so when he throws the ball he can get more on the plate. You see a lot of guys get lackadaisical and catch that ball moving away from the infield. Now watch see, he sets himself now he starts in right there. All his momentum is coming forward so that if Tettleton tries to tag up he's going to be, make, be able to make a strong throw. As I said, a lot of guys catches, catch that ball moving backward, and you can't get anything on the throw. That's why he's a gold glove center fielder. Four times running. Well, let me explain that about Ripken. Every middle infielder through the course of a season will get tired mentally because he is in every play, has to think every play, has to tell the outfielders where to throw the ball. He has to do so many things. So it does take its toll. But what I was saying, by moving him now from shortstop to third base, I don't think would help him because he does everything now naturally at shortstop. And if he goes to third base, that's going to put added pressure on him to react to these things and think about them before they happen. Now at shortstop, half the time he just reacts to the things because he knows what's going to happen on every play and he knows every situation. So it does help him, but by the same token, being a middle infielder, you have more wear and tear on your body physically and mentally. A ball and a strike to Bob Melvin who was called out on strikes. Did it detract from your game offensively? Yeah, of course. I think it, it does because you have to give most of your concentration when you're in the field you have to give 100 percent concentration defensively to that position because that's your number one job. As compared to most outfielders left fielders and right fielders they just relax out there. Easy. Anybody can do that. Right. <laughs> Look at this guy. Been standing there the whole day. And now one comes to him. Hey, tough chance, John Moses. Stood there thinking about his next at bat until <laughs> exactly. that ball came out there. That's it for the Orioles. Good area. Should be in the Hall of Fame one of these days. Here's Brian Harper as we go back to action. And uh, Pete Harnish throws him a called strike one. I had to Joel Skinner catch you with the Cleveland Indians walk up to me the other day, Joe. He's a, a fan of our Sunday night telecasts. Never misses one if he's not traveling and he says point out Joe Angel to me. So what do you need from Joe? He says, I just want to see what he looks like. You keep calling Joe Morgan Joe Angel all the time and I'm intrigued. Well that was him and Joe Angel excellent broadcaster and real nice guy. I wouldn't go that far. There, there you see Brian Harper trying to get on base any way he can. 
with an 0-2 count, that's not a bad ploy. He says the ball hit him, and it may hit the bat for a foul ball, but he's saying that it got him on the shoulder. Oh, that's terrible pain there. Um. <laughs> this is not the NBA, Ryan. You have to work for what you get. He pops one up. The right fielder, Finley, is waiting. Now he'll move a little bit. And you saw that shot there, never ever once taking his eyes off the ball. One away in the fourth inning. No score in this game. Paul Sorrento coming up now. Big crowd at the Metrodome. Since the Twins uh, went to that World Series in 1987, what a thrilling series it was as they beat the Cardinals. They've had tremendous attendance here at the Metrodome. They did three million the following year. First American League team ever to do that. And why not? I mean, this is a, an exciting club, and they make a lot of things happen. It's a wild place to see a game. Very comfortable place. That's ball one to Paul Sorrento. You know, you mentioned that uh, Joel Skinner watches our broadcast and whatever. It reminded me that Larry Bird is a big baseball fan. I saw him at a golf tournament, and he was telling me how much he enjoyed the telecast, how much he enjoyed watching baseball. A lot of people do not realize that he was a very, very good baseball player. He, I, you know what position he played, right? Just Let's guess. See. Six nine. He must have been a shortstop. First base. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he was a very good uh, baseball player till he hurt his finger in college. Because he really loved baseball and he was a good player. So he watches this and he's in, he's a big baseball fan as well. You think he could have been? I mean, as great an athlete as he is. I'm sure he could have because he's also a very intelligent athlete. He would have adjusted to whatever he had to do to get to the major leagues, but. He was a first baseman and he hurt his finger, so he had to give up baseball. And the Boston Celtics are awfully oh, glad he did. I'm sure they are. Another guy, Magic Johnson, is a big baseball fan as well. Celtics are a team that a number of years back had uh, one of those multi sport players, a baseball pitcher, played in the NBA, Gene Conley. He was about 6'9, I think. 6'8, 6'9. This is Orsalak, medium deep left field, and Sorrento is retired. Two men down. In the Twins fourth inning, no score in the game. Well, Harnish throws a fastball away, even though the catcher sets up inside. He throws the ball out over the plate. And Sorrento hits a fly ball to left field. He has a good shoulder turn, nice stride. He opens very well, and he follows through pretty well. He stands a little more straight up than pitching coach might advise. You'd like you to bend your back a little bit more on your follow through. This is John Moses. He struck out with a runner at second and two down in the second. No score. We're in the fourth inning. Harness delivers. Strive. You mentioned Gene Conley used to play basketball and baseball. You know, for the Celtics, he played basketball. Bill Russell, a former Celtic great, used to tell a joke all the time about he said Gene Conley said he had to get out of shape to go back to play baseball. <laughs> I didn't like that, but he used to tell me that all the time. Those NBA guys, they think they're the only guys in shape. Right, that's what he felt like, but he said baseball players were out of shape, and I I disagree with him. There may be a couple, but there are also a couple in the NBA who look out of shape too. So <laughs> I think it goes that most players in all sports are in pretty well, good shape. I like shape. that Jordan fellow. He didn't look like he's in that great <laughs> of shape to me. <laughs> Fouled out of play by Moses, account 0 and 2. They played some basketball in here. This past year in the NBA at the Metrodome. Here's an idea of what the Twins have done in this ballpark over the years and what they haven't done here this year. They're below 500 even here so far in 1990. Well, I think the, uh, the amazing thing to me is that they got within three and a half game of the A's and then just fell apart. Hewlett drops it and he has no play. So Moses is safe. They're scoring that as a base hit. Now Moses runs well. Yeah, but a ball like that that bounces up, he should be able to make the play. See, that ball is not on the ground or tough backhanded play. It's a big hop, and he should be able to come up with it. In fact, he runs away from the ball. See, one thing you can't do on AstroTurf is run away from the ball toward the outfield. It makes it a tougher play. You have to cut across. And even if you have to take it on the short hop, he here's, actually played that into a base hit. Here's Greg Gagne. 
Right handed hitter the ninth place hitter strike one pretty tough looking fastball from Harnish there. Maybe the scorer was worried about Hewlett's consecutive game uh, errorless streak. <laughs> Hewlett's got uh, 10 straight games since coming back from his injury. Well I'd hate to see Cal Ripken have a play like that. It would be a lot tougher of course than the shortstop to throw the guy out. Cal got charged with an error the other night in Baltimore. The official scorer then after talking with everybody involved Cal it was a play on a throw toward third. He talked to a number of players and even uh, people on the other ball club Cleveland third base coach and uh, some of the other people involved and everybody that he talked with was unanimous that the play should have been scored as an error on the center fielder who made the throw. So the error was removed the streak lives. Well the one thing that I'm always concerned with is you know because I was in a situation where I was going after a streak like that once. The one thing I'm concerned with is I want it to be a fair scoring situation because the guy who holds that record worked very hard to get that record. And the guy that takes it from him should have to work equally as hard and do as good a job as he did. And that's the thing that always scares me about consecutive airless games and things like that. That's a check swing foul. The, the uh, let's go back Joe the other night. This is the play on which Ripken was charged with an error in Baltimore. Well the point is did uh, Brinkman have any plays that were changed or whatever and that's that's always the point that I worry about. It was a base hit to center field now. Devereaux, see Devereaux, Devereaux yeah. fumbled the ball. Now he comes up and fires to third. All right the ball went off of Ripken's glove. And it went away and they called it an error. We'll get another look at it. This is live action knocking the mask right off of Bob Melvin. One and two. Well you know without being there being honest with you I couldn't make a judgment but first of all Devereaux made the error in center field. He bobbled the ball and it puts pressure on everyone else to try to make up for his mistake. So I would have to think that the error should be charged to, to the outfielder but here again I was not there. And it's very tough to gauge from some of the angles that we get. Well, Hewlett was the third baseman behind Ripken. Cal trying to cut that throw off, keep a runner from going to second. There's uh, Moses back to the bag at first. Two down here in the fourth inning, no score in the game. Hewlett said if Cal had never touched the ball, he might have had a hard time going wide of the bag to get it himself. Harnish was the pitcher. He was backing up the play. He concurred with that. The third base coach for Cleveland, Rich Dower, he also agreed. That's foul and out of play. One and two the count. So the official score then changed the ruling. Well if they're all there and they have a better shot of it obviously than we would here. Uh, and, and, uh, and being perfectly honest with you you have to admire the official score at least he took the time to ask people who were involved in the play and had a better angle than he had because he could not have a perfect angle from up here in the press box either. So but my only concern again is that you know like I said the guy that holds a record you know they worked hard to get that record and I hate for something to happen where it's given to someone else and taken away from them. One two pitch and it's low two and two. Well Cal did not make any kind of a, an effort to get the call changed no. and his comment afterward was hey I'm not going to lose any sleep over it one way or the other. Uh, the man who does own the record now sharing it with Cal right at the moment Eddie Brinkman and there were many shortstops better. Well that's my point. Uh, Brinkman is obviously very proud of the fact that he played great defense and that was after his claim to fame. That's a base hit to right field. Moses will stop at second base as Finley comes up with the ball to the cutoff man Cal Ripken. Gagney with a single. That was quite an at bat by Gagney. Well, he had a good year last year, as I mentioned. He battled very well last year. He hit the ball to right field a lot more. And he became a much better hitter. In the past, he said he had tried to hit too many home runs, and it cost him average wise. So now he's trying to go the other way again because his average is down low. He's trying to raise it back up. So here's Al Newman now. Newman has twice come up with nobody on base in this game and he's hit a single and he's drawn a walk. Now he's in a spot with two down to try and deliver a run. But he's hitting below 200 in these kinds of situations this year. It's not his strength. That's a foul off the left field line. It'll go back out of play. You brought up a point earlier that Craig Worthington did not hit for a high average last year but he hit well with men in scoring position. I personally believe that you may have freak years if you're not a good hitter and drive in runs and hit well and with men in scoring positions. 
But I think in order to do well in, with men in scoring position over your career, you have to be a pretty good hitter. So you have to hit around 280 to 300 anyway if you're going to be consistent. One strike delivery, and that's fouled back out of play. I would bet that if you take a guy's career average as far as hitting with men in scoring position and compare it to his, oh, his, his career batting average, that you know would be close. It wouldn't be like 200 point difference. It may be a guy hits 270 and then hits up through hitting 330 with men in scoring position. That would work, but not when you have 270. You're not going to hit 400. That's Tom Kelly. Is he's trying to figure out how to score some runs for the Twins. They've gone 16 innings, I guess, now without scoring a run, or 15 and two thirds. Two on, two out. Hewlett. And he throws him out. The side is retired. The Twins have put five men on base in the last two innings, and they've stranded all five of them. No score at the end of four. Here we go to the fifth inning now from the Metrodome in Minneapolis. John Miller with Joe Morgan. And a curveball from Roy Smith to Mike Devereaux, Baltimore's ninth place hitter. His ball one. Devereaux fouled the first, his first time. No score in this game. High pop fly. Gagney out. Moses in now Moses backing up a little bit and he's got it. I don't think the wind was blowing it around <laughs> out there was it? Wednesday we've got baseball on the holiday the Independence Day celebration will be there with America's national pastime the first place Red Sox right here against these Minnesota Twins Joe uh, you want to do that game yeah let's do it OK yeah. we'll be here that's 1 30 Eastern 12 30 Central. Here is Steve Finley. A strike. Finley, one for two in the game. You know, John, the, the Baltimore Orioles this year obviously are a lot different than last year. As you mentioned, they were in the race right down to the last weekend of the season. And I think it's just a matter of they're just a little off in every department. It's a high drive down the line. If it's fair, it could be trouble. It is gone. A home run for Steve Finley. And there's that porch in right field. It is very, very inviting. That is the first home run of the year for Steve Finley. So that is not something he often does. Well. He gets a fastball inside and he drives it over the right field wall. Watch this is a fastball and it's inside about belt high. And a lot of left handers can really hit the ball inside from the belt down. And he turns on it very well. And I think he knew it was gone the moment he hit it. And he's taking a razzing from his teammates because that is his first home run. Now that strike two to Tim Hewlett, the first pitch to him is also a strike. So it is 0-2 to Hewlett. He is flying to left center and he's fouled out to first. I mean it's 327 right down the line there, but uh, just kind of a high fly ball and it was out of here with plenty to spare over that 23 foot high curtain. Steve Finley hit two home runs last year. One of them a grand slammer against a left hander at Yankee Stadium Chuck Carey. He likes these short porches. A ball and two strikes to Tim Hewlett. Randy Milligan is on deck. So we have a run in this ball game. The Orioles ahead one nothing. Slow curve. It's inside two and two. That is the first home run of this series for the Orioles, and it is the second home run of the whole series. Herbeck hit one Friday night, and Hewlett goes down swinging. Two down. Well, he set him up with a changeup inside, and he comes back with a fastball on the outside corner, and Hewlett has to take a seat. I remember talking to Tom Seaver once. He used to throw that real leafless pitcher every once in a while, but he'd always follow it up with the good fastball. Curveball to Milligan in the dirt. Milligan one for two. This guy, uh, Joe, he, three years ago, he was named the top Triple A player with Tidewater, the Mets Triple A club. Curve for a strike. Led the league in homers, RBIs, hit over 300. Just didn't get a shot. Went to the Pirates. They gave him about 80 at bats and they gave up on it. But he's been an important man in this Orioles lineup. Well, he has good power. He swings the bat well. And I think the surprising part of it, he's been a good RBI man. And that's that's what you want from your first baseman. You'd rather, 
you know if you have to give up something you don't care about the average as much but you want a guy at first base that has some pop in his bat that can drive in some runs. I think that's one of the things that baseball has gotten away from in the last few years. And that by that I mean there are certain positions on the baseball field that are supposed to supply power and RBIs. Your first baseman your corner position your first baseman your third baseman your left field and your right field. Those guys are supposed to have some pop in their back. And he draws a walk which is something else that he often does. It's the first walk of the game. And there's Milligan. He's now added to that total his 66th walk. Tantleton is coming up now is second in the American League. And everybody else is a little ways behind those two. And I guess you could take that a couple of different ways Joe as we see Tantleton come up. He's one for two. Sounds like some teams are not afraid to pitch around these two guys. Ball one. Two down runner at first a run in the Orioles ahead one nothing. Now you used to draw a lot of walks but you hit up in front of those benches and Perez's and Lee Mays and guys like that. Right. These are the guys who are supposed to be driving in those guys. Yeah you're you're not looking for base on balls from your fourth fifth and sixth place hitters. A ball and a strike. Meanwhile leadoff man Finley has walked 17 times. And those top two hitters uh, they rotate a lot of people around in those spots but none of them draw many walks. Phil Bradley who had uh, some wrist surgery here recently hit a lot of lead off for the Orioles and he did draw his share of walks. But nothing compared to what these fellows have been getting. Frank Robinson believes that the Orioles are going to have to get a legitimate cleanup type hitter to go with these guys. One and two to Tentative. There you see Al Newman and how deep he's playing Mickey Telton. Telton doesn't run that bad for a catcher, but Newman feels like with the AstroTurf, the ball will get to him very quickly. Almost like a fourth outfielder out there. A change up high and away. Two and two the count. But see, one of the things that happens when you get that deep is it makes the angle you have to take to the ball a bigger angle, and the ball picks up speed on the AstroTurf. So when you play deep like that, unless the ball hits right to you or within five feet, you're really losing range rather than gaining range. Three and two the count. You ever play out there like that on the artificial turn? No, I didn't play there because I felt like you'd lose range. If a ball's hit up the middle right now, it, he would never get to it. I don't care how slowly or whatever, the ball would pick up speed, and because he has to run so far, he would not be able to get to the baseball. Hockey goaltender comes out toward the exactly. man with the puck to cut down his angle. Exactly. Runner going, strike three, swinging. Tendlin chased a bad ball. So the Orioles get the one on the Finley homer. One man left on. They've stranded six. One nothing Orioles. The year was 1971, and Baltimore's Mike Cuellar faced Harmon Killebrew. And that may be it. It is. And that was uh, one of 573 that number three killer Armin Killebrew hit in his career and Joe I know you want to join me in wishing him all the best he's in the hospital out in Phoenix recuperating he had surgery for a bleeding ulcer and we send all of our best wishes to Killebrew great player and just a great guy. Yes he is and uh, Armin was a great great home run hitter where you see Tony Oliva in second place Bob Allison Kent Herbeck. And that 559 total of Killebrew, what he hit while he was with the Twins. He went on and played some for Kansas City at the end of his career, hit 573 all told. Here's Gene Larkin. The Twins are trailing 1 0. Pete Harnish with a five hit shutout going. He's gotten out of a lot of trouble the last couple of innings in particular. Well, you mentioned at the beginning that he was a bulldog, and that's what he shows me that he is a tough competitor. See, the way I gauge a pitcher is not so much of all the other stats that you look at, but I gauge him on how he gets out of trouble. You know, a lot of guys, when they get a couple of men on, the floodgates open. Other guys are tough enough to get out of jams. And those are the kind of guys you want pitching for you. Well, Salak hurries in and he has to play it on the bounce. That was a surprise. Well, what happens in the in the Metrodome is that the outfielders, other than Kirby Puckett, are just not aggressive, especially visiting teams. 
because they know that ball will bounce over their heads. They know that they may lose it in charging the ball. A lot of things can go wrong. So they play cautiously in the outfield, and a lot of times that'll cost you. So now Larkin is aboard his first hit, and here comes the power. Puck at the hitter. Her back on deck, Gaetti after that. These are the big guys, the hitters and the twins who cause lots of trouble. Bucket showing bunt, taking a wild fastball from Harnish. Ball one. Baltimore one, Minnesota nothing, last of the fifth. Well, Kirby does not bunt a lot, but I think he just wanted to try to bring Worthington in a little bit so if he hits the ball on the ground, it'll go past him. The outfield backed up deep for Puckett. He's hit one home run more this year already than he hit all of last year. There's Larkin at first. That's down the right field line. Slicing foul. It's a ball and a strike. There's the Minnesota third base coach Rick Renning. Over big leaguer with the Twins. I don't know if you can see it there or not, but he's got a shiner. His right eye. He's got a black eye. Playing Pepper before a game. Ball was thrown into kind of high. He reached the bat up for it. Glanced off the bat, hit him right in the eye. There's no clubhouse fracas or anything like that. <laughs> Larkin is back. Pete Harnish, he's having to to battle his way through these uh, last few innings. He's already gone one inning more though than he went here the last time he pitched at the Metrodome. Kirby chased a bad one. Well, he's swinging at that high fastball from Harnish, and he's not going to be able to do much with it. That's the pitch Harnish uh, struck him out with back in the first. And then the next time up, he waited and got the ball down, and he got a single to left field. So watch his swing. He tries to get up the ladder, but you can't. The reason you can't handle that high fastball is you start with your hands in a hitting position. You drop them a little bit, and that's why you can hit the low pitch. You can't drop them and raise them back up in time to get to the high fastball. That's why people have trouble with the high fastball. One two pitch. That's the low fastball base hit center field. Larkin will stop at second as Devereaux up with the ball. Now the twins have uh, the base runners again but this time with nobody out and Kent Herbeck coming up. Well, that's why he was a batting champion. That's why he hits 335. You give him a pitch to hit and he hits it. That pitch is down and in and he lines it in the center field for a base hit. The best pitch for Harnish would have been to come back with a real high fastball and see if he would have chased it because he's thrown him two low pitches and he's gotten base hits off of both. Inexperience from Harnish? Well, I don't like to say that because Bob Melvin is a catcher and Bob Melvin is a good catcher. I've watched him work on several occasions with when he's with the San Francisco Giants. But I think the better pitch there was the high fastball to try to get Puckett to chase another pitch. He's already proven that he can hit strikes, so let's see if he can hit pitches that are out of the strike zone. Well, here's Kent Herbeck. The Baltimore bullpen is going to get busy now. How many more of these uh, crises can Harnish handle? There's the bullpen, the right-hander, Brian Holton, the left-hander, Kevin Hickey. A couple of veterans out there. Two men on, nobody out. Baltimore one, Minnesota nothing. Ball one. Frank Robinson trying to stay calm. He does look calm right there, doesn't he? Looks untroubled. Hey, he has really changed since I played for him in 1981 and 82. Mike himself feels that he's he's learned over the years a few things. Thinks he handles things a little better, particularly in relations with the press and even with his players. Two and all the count now to Herbeck. Well, now, I I think at the end of 1982 when I played for him I thought he was a great manager at that time 81 I wasn't so sure he was still a little bit rough around the edges so to speak. I thought in 82 he became a very good manager and that he understood the players much better and he would he had more patience with with the players and uh, I think he's continued to get better in that area and I think he's a great manager. 2 0 pitch her back hits it off the hands foul and it is two balls and one strike. There is Gene Larkin the runner at second base. And Kirby Puckett, the runner at first. Nobody out. Twins have seven hits in the game already against Harnish. Plus, he has walked two of them. They've had nine base runners, and we're in the fifth inning with nobody out. And yet they have not scored. One-nothing Baltimore. 
Yeah, but he keeps walking this tightrope. He's going to fall off pretty soon. You can't do this with good hitters. Here's the 2 1 pitch to Kent Herbeck on the way. Here's a high drive deep in the right center field. This one has a chance. It is gone. A home run. A three run homer for Herbeck. 3 1 Minnesota. The one thing you can't do is give good hitters a shot at you a couple of times a game with men in scoring position or men on base. You walk, you can only walk that tight rope so long, and the big guys will get you. It's a low fastball, and Herbig just drives it. I mean, this ball is hit way up there. That's why I say the ball travels well. It's a low fastball. He's a good low fastball hitter, good extension, and right there he knows it's a home run. And just like that, it is now three to one Minnesota. Here's Gaetti swings it as slider, strike one. Gary Gaetti, 0 for two. He's twice grounded out. Once with the bases loaded. That was in the third. Twins have finally broken through against Harnish. In the dirt, one ball, one strike. The eleventh home run of the year for Kent Herbeck. And he's the man. I mean, Kirby Puckett is one of the great players in the game, but on this ball club. It seems to revolve around Herbeck and him hitting his homers and driving in his runs, driving in Puckett. Well, it works because of Puckett and the guys in front of him. A guy like Puckett, who will always be on base, will give you the opportunities to break open the ball game. Not only that, what happens there is with runs at first and second, there was no place to put Herbeck. Last time, he had a base open, even though it wasn't first base. He could pitch to him and get away with walking him. He couldn't have walked him in that situation. That one's going to fall in. You see Finley waiting for it. Again, the lack of aggressiveness caused by the Metrodome. And this is the, the kind of ball the Twins play in here. The first hit of the inning, Larkin's bloop to left, may be caught in other ballparks by Orsalak. Right. Then Puckett got that single to center. Now, boom, the table's set, and her bet goes deep. And Frank Robinson has sent his pitching coach, Al Jackson, to the mound as the bullpen continues to do its work. L. Rod Hendricks as Jackson goes to the mound, the bullpen coach signaling that both of those pitchers are ready out there. Holton the right-hander and Hickey the left-hander. Well, I, I think Harnish is trying to explain. I just had to come in with a pitch, and he hit it. You know, and I think he's also bemoaning the fact that, as you mentioned, two of the hits this inning were little bloopers that fell in front of the outfielders. But that's what the Metrodome is all about. You know, you bloop a couple in, then the guy hits a blast on you. And that's the way the Twins have played over the last few years. You know, they had a lot of guys at the top of the order scrapping the Dan Gladdens, the Kirby Puckets, and all these guys getting base hits in front of Kent Herbeck and, and Gary Gaetti. And that's the way they play baseball. They chop a few, flare a few, and bang a few. Now here is Harper. There's nobody out in this inning. Runner at first. Three runs in. It is three to one. The Twins lead Baltimore. Harper is flying to center and flying to shallow right. Four straight hits for the Twins in the fifth inning. Larkin a single. Puckett a single. Herbeck the three run homer. Then Gaetti with the single. He's at first. And that one's down the line, but foul. Doesn't this kind of remind you a little bit of last week's inning in Cincinnati where Fernando Valenzuela was pitching? And they hit a few bloops, hit them off the end of the bat, little shallow fly balls that fell in front of the outfielders, and then the guy hits a three-run homer. It's exactly what happened in tonight's ball game. That's right. Chris Sabo hit the ball out of the park against Fernando. That made it a six-run inning. Fernando gave up eight runs in five innings last week. And then, only one bad pitch. Then he made the Cardinals pay for it <laughs> Friday night. All right. A no-hitter at Dodger Stadium. There goes Gaetti. The ball is a little looper towards second. It's caught by Hewlett for a double play. So the hit and run backfires against the Twins there. It's uh, just what Harnish needed. Yes, he did. What happens is that Harper tries to hit the ball the opposite way. If he would have just went ahead and hit the ball, he may have been all right. But he was trying to shoot the ball to the right side, but the second baseman wasn't covering anyway. And in doing so, he jammed himself and he hit him to a double play. 
Paul Serrato, rookie designated hitter, who has doubled and flied to left, takes ball one. Three to one. Twins ahead. We're in the fifth. Long way to go in this one yet. But now you're seeing what the Metrodome is all about in this inning. There's a called strike. Two and oh. But I also want to remind you that ball that Herbig hit, it went over the 408. That's 408 to center field. That ball went way up, almost above all the seating, the temporary seating they have up there. Foul out of play. I mean, that's a long way. He earned it. Yeah. It wasn't any high fly ball no. over the, the curtain. That was a long line drive. That's the second homer that Herbeck has hit against the Orioles this year. 25th lifetime. He's hit more against the Orioles than he's hit against any other team. They measured that one out. They have some kind of a system for measuring home runs here to any part of the ballpark. Their guess on that one was 438 feet, which was almost 100 feet farther than Steve Finley's. <laughs> Steve Finley's was measured at 358, and Herbeck's is at 438. Two down. Here's the one two pitch to Sorrento. Ball two from Harnish. Two and two the count. Harnish has not often been hurt by the long ball this year. He's given up only six home runs in 93 innings and two of those in his last start. Well, you have to understand Herbeck is a home run hitter and he got behind him two and one in the count. And Herbeck was sitting on the fastball, I'm sure. And he got it into his power zone. Fastball down and out over the plate. He's going to get hurt a lot of times if he has to throw Herbeck a two and one fastball in that situation. I mean, that's Herbeck's pitch and that's Herbeck's count. So there's not a lot you can do if you have to come in on that pitch. That one misses inside. Full count now to Sorrento. Moses would be next. Fifth inning, three runs in for Minnesota. Three to one the score. All of the scoring coming in this inning. Finley hit his homer for the Orioles in the fifth, and then Herbeck's. A three run shot here. Strike three called to Sorrento. That's the inning. The Minnesota bench beckoning to Paul to come back to the bench, Sorrento. Metro Dome, Sunday night baseball, Minnesota three. And the Baltimore Orioles one is Joe Orsalak. Fouls one away against right hander Roy Smith, who for the first time in the game goes to work with the lead. Orsalak has singled and he has struck out. Now each one of these pitchers has had to labor in this ball game. That is a foul ball. Herbeck goes over to grab it. That is the 93rd pitch thrown by Smith. We're only in the sixth inning. And Pete Harnish has thrown 96 pitches. June is over. Twins, please win. ESPN. The June swoon had reared its ugly head for the Minnesota Twins in a big way. It's caught a lot of teams. <laughs> but it's amazing, as I mentioned, that in May they were three and a half games behind the Oakland A's. Herbeck, he's a great big guy, but he moves around very freely and easily over there. I don't think he gets the respect as a defensive player that he deserves. That's a very good point, John. He is a good defensive player. Uh, he moves well for a big guy, and he short hops the ball as good as any first baseman. The throws from the infield that bounce, he short hops them very well. And picks him up. He's he's a good defensive first baseman. He's not a liability by any stretch of imagination. Now here's Cal Ripken. Interesting, as we just saw Herbeck. He and Ripken came up the same year, 1982, and they were the top two candidates for Rookie of the Year that year. Strike one to Cal. Cal is one for two. Yeah. Um, Ripken won the award. Right. Here they felt Herbeck should have won. And obviously they had reason to believe that he should have won it. They saw Herbeck every day. They didn't see Ripken every day, so they felt like Herbeck was the best, of course. Well, Ripken, it's a high drive deep to left. This one has a chance. Back to the wall is Moses. Gone. A home run. So Cal Ripken with his ninth home run of the year. And all of a sudden, balls are flying out of here. One homer in the first two games combined, and now we've had three in the last one inning plus. Cal has always been able to hit the ball down and in pretty well. He was struggling for a while handling the inside pitch. But now, as I mentioned, with his stance a little more square as we see it here, he can get the ball to that spot a lot quicker. See that ball's down and in, and he's able to bring the bat through very quickly. See how he's opened up already? As a foul out of play hit by Worthington off to the right Herbeck 
gives it a look but it's back in amongst the spectators. Cal Ripken's two for three. Three to two the score. Been a while since Ripken last hit a home run. Uh, I think as I mentioned earlier I think you're going to see him start to hit with more authority because from that position he can really drive the ball from the middle of the plate in. I think he had been struggling first half of the season with that ball inside especially up and in he wasn't handling it very well. So Worthington is gone on strikes fifth strikeout for Smith. Two down. Well we talked about Roy Smith's curveball at the beginning of the ball game. He does have a good one. And if we watch Worthington see he kind of checks on it a little late. Two down, nobody on. Here is Melvin. Three to two twin. There's a real slow curveball for a strike. Well, what made that such an effective pitch there is he didn't slow down his motion. Usually you slow your motion to throw that slow curve. He did not. He gives you a lot of arms and legs out there, doesn't he? Right, but it's a lot of times you see a, a, a guy that throws the slow curve, there's Juan Berenger warming up in the twins bullpen. You see a guy that throws a slow curve or a changeup. He actually slows his motion down, and a good hitter can see that, but he did not slow his motion on either one of those pitches. One and two the count to Melvin. Roy Smith. Cleveland for a while. Journeyman. Just off the outside of that fastball. Two and two the count. Found a home with the twins last year. So the last couple of months was one of the most effective starters. He won 10 ball games for them. 2 2 pitch. Way outside. That one ended up back by Bob Casey, the public address announcer here at the Metrodome, sitting in that little cage behind home plate. On those last two pitches, Worthington was aiming the ball. He was aiming the slider for the outside corner. He was aiming the fastball out there instead of just firing it. Here's a fastball. And pass to Diving Gagney. Base hit for Melvin. Hit number eight for the Orioles. Twins have nine hits. A lot of hits in this game, not so many runs. If you have the ground ball up the middle on AstroTurf, it's going to get through. This is Gagney. He gets a pretty good jump on the ball, and you see he's not running away from the ball. He's trying to cut the angle down. But he's not able to get there. If he would have taken a step behind that line, he would have had no chance at all of getting close to it. Devereaux, the ninth place hitter, 0 for 2, ball one, runner at first, two down. Melvin is no threat to try and steal. He is one of the, the slowest runners around. He and uh, Worthington both very slow runners. Devereaux, very fast. There's a strike on the outside, one and one. And that was another good fastball from Smith. That's the way he was throwing early in the ball game. He wasn't aiming it. He was just turning it loose toward the outside corner. Three two twins leading Baltimore in the sixth. Smith to the plate a real slow one in the dirt. Harper keeps it in front of him. Melvin will hold it first. By the way Cal Ripken with that home run. That's his first homer in two weeks. The last time he hit one was uh, June 17th against uh, the Boston Red Sox. He's got nine home runs for the year now. He's hit 20 or more homers each of the last eight years. Only shortstop ever to do it that many years consecutively. That's right, two game. Newman gets the foot out against Melvin. That's the inning. Baltimore comes up with a run and two hits. One man left on. They've left seven. We go to the last of the. Sixth inning, three to two. Baseball from the Metrodome. It's the Minnesota Twins three, the Baltimore Orioles two. This is John Miller along with Joe Morgan. We're glad to have you with us. We hope you join us every Sunday night, all through the baseball season. Next week we'll be in Cleveland. Now, Tuesday night, a big doubleheader: the Houston Astros at Shea Stadium to face the Red Hot Mets. They won again today over the Cincinnati Reds and Dwight Gooden. He might be pitching Tuesday night. He pitched last Thursday. The second half of the doubleheader from the West Coast, the Pittsburgh Pirates, and all of that heavy lumber at San Diego. Those are the two best hitting teams in the National League right now. Both uh, all kinds of offensive talent. When did the Padres lose a, a tough one today? 11 to 10, they lost to the Cubs. And they were up, I guess, uh, 10 to 7 or something going into the ninth inning. Seems to me. As we see John Moses taking ball one against Harnish here. Last Sunday, was it last Sunday? 
They were in Atlanta and had a, a big lead and then lost it in extra innings 11 to 10 that week too. This is Tim Hewlett. And Moses is retired one away. Let's take a look at some of the scores today. Baseball Boston 15 to 4 at the Texas had won twice there Cleveland. The Indians playing awfully well under John McNamara Toronto into the six game losing streak besting Oakland. A win for Willie Blair in relief. Uh, no hitter lost today by Andy Hawkins of the Yankees. Detroit clobbered Kansas City. Seattle beating Milwaukee in 12. As far as we know, there were no brawls in that game. What a wild <laughs> free for all they had last night at Seattle. Here's Gagney following one back. You see any videotape or any reports yeah. on that, Joe? Yeah, you know, the thing that's amazing to me, John, is when I played, when I first came to the big leagues, there was unwritten rules. You protect your players if you're a pitcher, et cetera, et cetera. All of a sudden now when people when pitchers protect their players they act like they want the world to know they have to tell everybody I threw at a guy or etc. I mean you don't have to do that you do what you have to do for your teammates and let it go at that. Well, who was this Bob Sebra last night hit somebody yeah, but I've heard several other guys do the same thing you know say I have to protect my players I have to do this I have to do that. That doesn't need to be public knowledge the players your teammates know that you protect them into the conversation. Deep center field, Devereaux going back. He seems to have this one within his sights, and he does. Gagney hit it well, but to the wrong part of this ballpark. Two down. Feed me. In the American League West, the White Sox, percentage points ahead of Oakland again. The White Sox were no hit today, and they won it by four. <laughs> <laughs> Things are going right for them. And there's Oakland right behind them by just a couple of percentage points. We'll see Oakland next Sunday, 8 o'clock Eastern, at Cleveland. This is the leadoff hitter, Al Newman. He is one for two with a walk, ball one. Two down, nobody on. Twins three, Baltimore two. Talk about Dave Stewart, who would be due to pitch Wednesday, coming back on short rest and working next Sunday. He's been talking about it in the papers, Joe, but what do you think? Will we get Stewart next Sunday? Well, if we do, he can't pitch in the All-Star game. Yeah, which would be tough because I think people would like to see a guy that pitched a no-hitter this year on the All-Star team. But, you know, that's decisions that will have to be made at that time by their Bobby Brown and, of course, Tony La Russa, who is managing the American League All-Star team this year. Base hit, past Harnish. Newman's been on base three times in this game as the leadoff hitter. That's his job. Keeps the inning going for Gene Larkin. Tenth hit for Minnesota. The toughest thing to do is throw a baseball and get in the fielding position before it comes back through. And on the AstroTurf, you have no time to react. The ball is just one hop and it's right by you if it's hit sharply. Here's Larkin. He's one for three. His single to left in the fifth. A bloop that fell in front of the suddenly timid Orsillai, who had been charging hard for it. Then all of a sudden, fearing that the ball might not be caught and go for extra bases, he laid back and it fell in, and that started a three run rally. And truthfully, when you have a one to nothing lead that the Orioles had at that time, Deep right center, Finley back for the catch, and that's the inning. Bullpen got busy there, but now they'll immediately sit down again. One left. Minnesota three, Baltimore two. We'll be back. Balls in South Minneapolis. Part of the backdrop for this ball game. We're indoors, however, in the beautiful Twin Cities. Twins three, the Orioles two, and a new pitcher has come on for the Twins. The big hard throwing right hander Juan Berenguer Joe. Yeah and Berenguer has done a good job as you can see for the twins but Berenguer throws a high fastball good fastball he throws a slider and he also throws a screwball. So there's Berenguer and the top of the order up for the Orioles there's strike one to Steve Finley. But you can see by his statistics that throwing strikes is a problem with him he has 35 strikeouts and 33 walks which is not very good because he is a strikeout pitcher and he walks a lot of guys as well. Finley hit a home run his last time. He's two for three in the game. Hitting leadoff Tim Hewlett.
Randy Milligan will follow in the seventh inning. It's a good situation for Baron Gare because he caused Tom Kelly a problem with a couple of writers earlier this year. He said that he wasn't being used right, and they went and asked Tom Kelly about that. And Kelly says, hey, I run this team. Get out of here. Don't ask me those types of questions. Fly ball into left center. Kirby Puckett is there. He should handle this one easily. He does. Finley retired. One away in the seventh inning. Tom Kelly. And I agree with Tom Kelly. It's his ball club to run. And if you listen to players, they're always going to feel like they're not used properly. You know, they feel like, hey, I should be pitched more. I should be given more opportunities to get a save. Or I should be hitting in a different spot in the batting order. But it's up to the manager to decide what is best for the entire ball club. And you can't worry about each individual player. But uh, sometimes, you know, you put in that position. And the writers are coming to question him about why he's not using Baron Gare more. Well, Kelly did say that he likes Baron Gare's attitude, though. He's only unhappy if he's not pitching regularly. He wants the ball. Right center field. That's into the alleyway. Hustling over Larkin. He cannot get to it. Extra bases for Hewlett. He is going to stop at second as Puckett gets the ball back in. Tim Hewlett with his first hit of the game. It's a one run lead for the Twins, and now the Orioles' power is coming up. Randy Milligan striding to the plate against Baron Gare. Well, Baron Gare, as I mentioned, is throwing, had trouble throwing strikes. He throws a strike here, a fastball about belt high, and Hewlett lines it in the gap in the right center field. Puckett plays it off and holds him to a double. Now, here's Milligan, the Orioles' home run and RBI leader. Ball one. Milligan 28 years of age rapidly becoming a very popular figure in Baltimore both for his abilities on the field and he's just a, a likable guy makes uh, countless appearances around town everybody loves him. Base hit could tie this game. Here's a breaking ball. Well, Frank Robinson Robinson would love him a little more if he could get a base hit right here and tie up the ball game. Make me love you Randy. Yeah. <laughs> Baltimore has nine hits. Milligan has one of them. He's also had a walk. Here's the Orioles manager, Frank, giving a little encouragement from the bench. Twins are protecting the foul lines at third base and first base. Puckett takes it, tagging up and heading for third is Hewlett, and he'll make it easily. Milligan gave that one a pretty good ride. I was surprised. He hit the ball very well. It wasn't. He just hit it to the wrong part of the ballpark, but he hit the ball pretty well. Two down, and here is Mickey Tettle in the cleanup hitter. The possible tying run of the game is over at third base. Tettleton, one four three. Baron Gare, 35 years of age. He's from Panama. He was uh, only the eighth. Panamanian ever to appear in a World Series when he got in with the Twins in 1987. And that's a ball inside. Used to be with the Tigers. There were a lot of ball clubs over the years. And earlier in his career, here's one of those guys threw 98 miles an hour and had no idea where the ball was going. Big moment here. The Orioles have a chance to tie the game in the seventh. Man at third. Two balls. Baron Gear has truly found a home here in Minnesota, however. You see the score 3 2 Minnesota. Baron Gear 8 and 1, 8 and 4, 9 and 3. This year 5 and 1. He's been a winner in this role. Set up man, middle relief. The 2 0 delivery. Strike on the outside. That makes it even harder to understand why anybody could complain about the way that. Tom Kelly has used him. <laughs> Sounds like he's been using him perfectly. Kelly may know a little more about it than Juan yeah, thinks. He's doing it. He's been using him perfectly. You see that defense now. The second baseman way out in right field again, but Herbeck right along the line at first. Gaetti protecting the line at third. Swing and a miss. Came right after him with a fastball. Two and two. Well, the one thing that Berenger is not afraid to do is challenge you because he has a good fastball. And especially when he gets it up, it's a real good fastball. See that? You see Tettleton dropping down. That's the danger of standing straight up. When you drop, you lower your head as well. You can see the long stride lowered his head below the ball. Two two pitch, and Tettleton laid off that one. 
Tantalin will strike out a lot, but he'll also get a lot of walks. Orsalak is on deck. Bear Gear trying to hold on to this one for Roy Smith, who is the pitcher of record. Six pretty good innings for Roy. Strike three called on the inside corner, and does Bear and Gear love that one? Yeah. El Lanzador Maravilloso. 3 2 Twins. Back at the Metrodome. We're into the last of the seventh inning. 31,000 plus here in attendance, taking their seventh inning stretch. And the Twins are coming up with the power. Puckett, Herbeck, and Gaetti against that man, the new Baltimore pitcher, right hander Kurt Schilling. Just up out of the minor leagues. He pitched here Friday and got a save in the Orioles' first game victory. So here's Schilling. And you see he pitched well on Friday night. Kirby Puckett, two for three, stands in. Check swing, strike call. It's 0 and 1. 3 to 2, Minnesota leading. You know, Kirby Puckett won his first batting title last year, John, but the Minnesota Twins have a history of batting title winners. That's up the middle, his third straight hit. Yeah, they've got kind of a lock on that the last uh, 25 years or so. Yeah. Tony Oliva, who was their hitting coach, he had three batting titles and would have had more. Except for he had gimpy knees and he did not get to play his full career out. And of course, Rod Carew won seven batting titles. So they have a history of batting titles here in Minnesota. Jeff Tonio, one of the great hitters of all times. If his knees would not have gone out, who knows how well, how much he would have hit. Here's Herbeck, speaking of guys who can hit, one of the Tony Oliva pupils, Kent Herbeck. Tonight he's grounded out walk and then he hit a booming three run homer in the fifth. All of the twins run scoring on that one swing. Three two twins ahead seven inning. the pitch from Schilling. That's gone but foul. Oh what a shot. That one is heading for parts unknown if the upper deck hadn't interrupted it maybe down into down into Dallas. Well it's a long foul but it's a good spot for Schilling It's up and in. And Herbert can't keep that ball foul. There's no way he fair. He can't keep the ball fair if you get it in under his hands like that. And away ball two, two and one to Herbeck. But he better not move that pitch out over the plate because he can keep it fair. Well, it was just a foul and just a strike, but it was breathtaking, aesthetically pleasing, and it scared the breast out of Schilling, I'm sure. <laughs> Especially if you're a young rookie and you look at something like that. His heart may have skipped a beat. Yeah, they don't do that in the minor leagues, he said. 2 1 delivery. Popped him up. That's a good spot, right under the hands. You can pitch him right there all day, but you got to get it there. Hewlett grabs it for the put out. Puckett holding on at first. We talked about Gary Gaetti, and we have a in the zone shot of Gary, and this is where you see how to pitch him. See this line right here? That's the inside corner of the plate. He will chase the ball off the plate inside. Out here is where to pitch him. You got to stay out of the middle of the plate with Gary. But you can pitch him off the plate inside. Here's Gaetti. Hasn't shaved in a few days. He's one for three. One at first, one out. We're in the seventh. Down the third baseline. Worthington to Hewlett one. Back to first. Off the bag. Kirby Puckett had something to do with that, I think. With Hewlett not being able to complete that would be double play. Two well, down. Schilling made a perfect pitch. He threw the ball down and away with the curveball. And Gaetti hit the ground ball. The third baseman Worthington. Watch Worthington. He goes across to Hewlett. Hewlett tries to come across the bag. But her Puckett did not slide. It was a tough double play because his rhythm was off. Here's uh, Brian Harper, the catcher. He's 0 for 3. 300 hitter. Despite going 0 for 3 tonight. 3 to 2, Minnesota. We've had 20 hits in this game. We've had three home runs, but just the five runs. Game filled with base runners. That's into medium deep center. But that's again the wrong place to hit it in this ballpark, unless you're Kent Herbeck. <laughs> one hit, one left for the Twins. Schilling gets through it. Three to two. Minnesota leading Baltimore. Now the Budweiser storyline of the ball game. Twins leading three to two. A lot of hits. 
Pete Harnish and Roy Smith they kept the score down despite a lot of trouble spots Ripken and Finley with solo homers for the Orioles and Kent Herbeck the big big blow a three run shot for the twins which has them leading even now as we go to the eighth inning that fella is uh, predicting that one day he'll hit a home run out there to that right field porch for not the twins just, not just a homer John a three run homer yeah <laughs> <laughs> And here come the uh, Baltimore Orioles now. Joe Orsalak leading it off against Juan Berenguer. Orsalak one for three in the game. He'll be followed by Cal Ripken and then Craig Worthington. The Twins are again protecting the foul lines on the infield against the extra base hit. There's a drive toward that porch in right field. Larkin running out of room. It is off the curtain. He'll have to go chase the carom. It is a stand-up double for Orsolai. Does that remind you of Fenway a little bit in left field? Just a high, lazy fly ball and just not much room out there. Well, you run out of room very quickly in straightaway right field here at the Master Dome. It was a high pitch from Baron Guerra. It's probably a high screwball or changeup. That's a high breaking ball. And you can see and go back to the wall and there's not a lot he can do Larkin plays the ball perfectly and he holds Orsalak to a double so the Orioles down by a run but they've got the possible tying run in scoring position nobody out here's Ripken two for three with a home run in this game strike one the question is what do you do here if you're Cal Ripken or what does Frank Robinson want you to do he has to know that already Frank and he has probably had conversations about this several times the point is do you want him to shoot the ball toward the right side and move the runner along or do you want him to try to drive in the run most of your managers like for the big guys or RBI guys to go ahead and produce the run in the right field or so like held up for a moment but I think he's still going to score as Larkin has to go deep into the corner to pick it up it's all tied up and Joe he went to the right side with it and that's the best of both worlds and got him home. Cal was three for 26 against Baron Gear lifetime before that hit. Well, I, I couldn't believe how Al Newman at second base was playing Ripken. He was playing way over by second base, which gave Ripken an even bigger hole to shoot for on the right side. And the pitch is away, and Ripken is going the other way all the way. He's driving the ball to right field, and Orsalak still has time to come in to score. That's a real long single, that's not a short single. So just like that, the score is all tied up here at the Metrodome. Three and three. Ball one to Worthington. Now the bullpens are both busy. We're in the eighth inning. Each team's closer is getting ready. Out in left field, the Minnesota right-hander, Rick Aguilera, who has become the heir apparent to Jeff Reardon and is doing a heck of a job. And there's Greg Olson, the Orioles' fine closer. They're both ready to see some action in this one. Well what Tom Kelly wanted from Baron Guerra was to get through the eighth inning and I'm sure he would have started the ninth inning with Aguilera. That's what a lot of your managers are doing now. You have to have setup men for your closer and you don't want your closer to pitch more than one inning to get a save. Two balls no strikes to Craig Worthington. That is into right center field and a base hit. Rounding second heading for third is Ripken and he'll make it easily. The throw cut off by Newman. Ripken had it in his mind that he was going to third all the way. Three straight hits for the Orioles now. Still nobody out. Joe, they came into the inning trailing. Now they're on the verge of taking the lead. Well, Baron Gare is getting the ball up, but not up enough. He's got a real effective high fastball, but he's getting all these pitches about belt high, and they're driving them the other way. Watch this pitch. It's not high enough to be an effective fastball. It's a little above the belt and Worthington just drives it in the right center field and he also drives that man into the showers Baron is gone and Aguilera comes in in a real tight jam first and third nobody out and we'll be back we're at the top of the eighth inning at the Metrodome John Miller Joe Morgan with you and we've got a tie ball game with Rick Aguilera in for the twins but the Orioles threatening to untie it Joe. Yeah they've got him in the jam here and they've got a couple of guys coming up who have actually had some success against Aguilera Bob Melvin is three for five in his career and Mike Devereaux is one for three they're going to pinch run at first base with Danell Nixon he's going to pinch run for Worthington 
Saw him in the World Series last year with the San Francisco Giants. Did a great job for the Giants. I was surprised that they let him go. There's the other runner, Cal Ripken Jr. on the right, Cal Ripken Sr. giving them instructions. Just like he has base. for all these uh, many years. Right. They're playing the infield in, the Twins. And Nixon a threat to steal the runner at first base. Ball one to Melvin. When you, you play the infield field. in like that, the balls hit a one hopper at one of the infielders. They may take the double play. If it's not a one hopper, they will come to the plate and get Ripken. A ball and a strike. The play for the runner at third base, if the balls hit sharply on the ground, is to head for the plate. I don't know if the Orioles will play it that way, but that's the normal play to stay out of the double play. But if it's not a double play ground ball, then you don't go. And Melvin hits double plays. He's not a very fast runner. Off the fists, and now Aguilera in on the count, one and two. The Orioles have not been very efficient in these kinds of situations. Getting runners home from third, hitting in the clutch. And well, their I, downfall this year. Right. I think that's one thing that Tom, uh, Frank Robinson told me before the ball game. He said the reason they're not contending like they were last year is because they're one hit in clutch situations away, one good pitch in clutch situations. They're just one of everything away, one good defensive play, et cetera. They're just one away from everything in clutch situations. Aguilera tried to pick Nixon off first base you make that move toward third base and then throw over to first and that's something I've never been able to understand how that's not a balk because you're not supposed to do anything to deceive the runner I don't know what it is if you're not trying to deceive the runner at first base by stepping toward third and then trying to get him at first spoken like a true base dealer yeah, I mean that's definitely deceiving the runner there goes Nixon it's a foul tip, but a hell for strike three, and Nixon gets the stolen base. Now, if that ball had been dropped, Melvin would still be up there, but Nixon would have to go back to first. Well, it's a high fastball from Aguilera, and he pitched Melvin very well. He stayed in tight on him. Now he comes way in with the fastball, and Melvin can't do anything with it, but Brian Harper doesn't do anything with it either. Um, Nixon had a good jump at first. And it was going to be tough to throw him out, but I think you have to throw the ball someplace. That is Nixon's fifth steal in five tries since becoming an Oriole just about two weeks ago. <laughs> Cal Ripken at third, Nixon at second. Now the Orioles are going to go to their bench with two men in scoring position. They've got the left-handed hitter, Greg Walker, the only left-handed hitter on the bench, and he's coming out now to bat for the right-handed hitting, Mike Devereaux. Another weakness for the Orioles, Joe, as we see Kelly head for the mound now has been a lack of any kind of left handed hitting in the ball club they have very few in fact he's one of only four left handed hitters on the entire roster well, and that is very unusual because what you try to do as a team is have a couple of left handers coming off off the bench even two to one over their right handers because most of your closers most of your late inning relievers are right handed so you'd rather have a couple of left handers that come off the bench than you would right handers. But of course there are some hitters who come off the bench who can handle both left handed and right handed pitching. This is the veteran Greg Walker. He had some fine years with the Chicago White Sox. And once was a, a hated rival of the Orioles back in the early 80s when the two ball clubs played each other in the championship series. And they're playing the infield in as well now well, as they did before. They're playing the infield in. That means they have to go to the plate or just take the run one guy at first base. When you play in the infield in on this type of astroturf, you are really giving away a lot because the ball doesn't have to be hit hard to get through this infield because it's very quick. 3-3 three, three time. That's foul and out of play. All right, you're Greg Walker. What are you looking for here? What are you trying to do? What's your plan? Well, first of all, you try to get the ball in the air. You do not want to hit a ground ball to one of these infielders. And until you get two strikes, that should be your objective. That's Cal Ripken Sr. over at third base. But that should be your objective. The first two strikes should be trying to get the ball to the outfield in the air. Now, if you get two strikes, you just want to hit the ball hard someplace. And if you do that with the infield in and you hit it on the ground, it usually will go through the infield. 3-3 three, three, tie. The pitch. Ball two. It is two balls and one strike to Greg Walker. Crowd very quiet, 31,785, but they're all kind of holding their breath right now. 
The worst thing in the world would not be for him to walk Greg Walker. I mean, if you try to pitch him tough, you try to get the strikeout, you pitch to his weakness, but if you miss, that's okay. You got the bases loaded, and then you try to get a double play on the next guy. Looked like Walker thought he had a pitch to drive to the outfield there, but he didn't get it. Well, you look for a ball, you know, belt high and above, but it also depends on who's throwing out there. Some guys throwing 90 plus mile an hour fastball, they get it up, and you can't handle it. And Aguilera has a good fastball. You know, look at Frank Robinson. He was a great, great hitter in this type of situation. And he can't do anything about it. And he can't <laughs> comprehend why his ball club's been so poor in exactly. these situations. I've talked to him about this, you know, when we were, when he was a manager for the Giants, and he just doesn't understand it either. Two two pitch. Foul into the batter's box. That was a good pitch by Aguilera. He went with him after him with the high fastball a couple of times, and he tried to throw the sinker. So if he does hit it, he'd hit it on the ground. Now I think you'd see him try to go back up and in to get the strikeout. The Orioles had 12 hits in this game. They've hit two home runs in the game. They put 13 men on base, but they have three runs. The Twins can tell the same uh, the same kind of a story. The pitch, ball three. Right. Three and two to Walker. He tried to go inside, but he wasn't up and in. He was going just to try to get the ground ball. There's Tom Kelly. He's trying to help Aguilera get out of this jam. Well, Aguilera has gotten Kelly and the Twins out of enough jams this year. He's been outstanding. On deck, another left-handed hitter, Steve Finley. Runners at second and third. The pitch on the way. Struck him out on the split finger. Chased a bad ball, did Walker. Two down. If you're a hitter and you're hitting in this situation, you have to forget about the count because a pitcher will throw you any pitch in this situation. He's got a base open. The count was three and two, and I think Walker felt like that was a fastball. But that's what the split finger does to you. It appears to be a fastball when the guy releases it. But once it approaches the plate, it just the bottom falls out of it. Now the Orioles, who had had the runner at third with nobody out, have not been able to get him home. Melvin struck out Walker has struck out that leaves it to Finley. You could also see a little bit of disgust on Frank Robinson's face in the background there when we showed you a shot of Walker. They're going to walk Finley intentionally. Well you've got a right handed hitter on deck and you have no other left handed hitters left on the bench. Right. So they're going to pitch to Hewlett in this situation. And I think it's a good situation thing to do anyway because it also puts a force out at each base. You can force a runner out any place. And that takes a little bit of the pressure off of your defensive infield when they have a play at each base. You know, when the runners are second and third and two down, it's a tough play to go all the way across the diamond from the hole at shortstop or deep in the hole at third. If you have a runner at first, you can force someone out at second, makes it a short throw. Well, also with the bases loaded, the Orioles have been suffering from the bases loaded blues this year. I mean, when you were a hitter, Joe, when you came up with the bases loaded, that was your spot, wasn't it? Well, I, I think you have to approach it properly, and that's what I say about discussions with Frank Robinson. What you have to do is go to the plate with a thought pattern in mind. First, the first couple of strikes are mine. After that, I have to hit the pitcher's pitch. So what you do is you try to get the guy to give you a pitch that you can handle and drive into the outfield until you get two strikes. But when you get that pitch, you can't miss it. If you're sitting there with an open mind without any game plan, it's awfully tough. You end up swinging at a lot of bad pitches. The Orioles' team batting average with the bases loaded is 184. Bases loaded, two down. A 3 3 tie. Ball one. There's Cal Ripken. He's the runner at third. He drove in the tying run in this inning with a single. Donnell Nixon, the pinch runner, he's at second. He stole second base. And Steve Finley, who was walked intentionally at first. The pitch. Foul back. Doing the rising fastball. One ball, one strike to Tim Hewlett. Well, he did Hewlett, I thought, did a good job there. He made him get the ball up where he thought he could handle it. And he had a good swing at it. He just missed it. But that's the difference. When you're in a bases loaded situation and you get a pitch to hit, you have to hit it. Hewlett's a veteran. He goes up there with a plan. He's done well for the Orioles, both last year and this year, when he's been healthy. Bases loaded, two down. All three of the runners ready to go in anything. A run is in. It's the Orioles three and the Twins three. 
perhaps the game hanging in the balance here. Now Hewlett tired of waiting for Aguilera and he backs away and now Harper will go out and talk this over with Aguilera. They have a little difference of opinion here and what to do with Hewlett. Well I don't think they have a difference, difference of opinion. I think they want to make sure that they're on the same exact plane. They may both be thinking fastball but the point is where are we going to throw this fastball or they may be thinking breaking ball and make sure you don't hang it. All right try it again. All three of the runners with their leads and now again time taken. Hewlett backs away. A 3 3 tie in the eighth. Well I think that was really Aguilero stepping off because Harper went directly to the outside corner and it looked like Aguilera changed his mind about what he wanted to throw. Here it comes. Strike two. A fastball. That low fastball. The low strike zone. Now Hewlett in a hole. One ball, two strikes. So that's what makes the split finger so tough now. That pitch was a low fastball and it just stayed right there. Now if he starts a ball in the same spot and it's the split finger, Hewlett will have to go after it because it looks like the same pitch. Aguilera set. It comes. It was the split finger, and he struck him out. Aguilera strikes out the side, and he keeps that runner at third base. The bases loaded. Blues hit the Orioles again. Three men left on. They get the tying run, though. Last of the eighth coming up. Three, three. Since 1907, the small car specialist from Japan. By MCI, let us show you. And by Budweiser, the king of beers. Remember, know when to say when. Sunset in the Twin Cities, boating on Lake Calhoun. And there are lakes aplenty in this part of the country. Summertime, we're following the summer game here at the Metrodome. Changes for the Orioles. There are many. Steve Finley has moved from right field into center field now. Brad Commons goes into the game to play right field. A new third baseman has come in, Rene Gonzalez. And a new pitcher, the Orioles' closer, the big man out of the bullpen, Greg Olson. Just two years removed from the College World Series. He had uh, an amazing rookie season, and uh, so far this year he's been even better. First man up, Paul Sorrento, the rookie, and he takes ball one. Now the Orioles as we see Sorrento one for three in the game the Orioles are guarding those foul lines at both third base and first base. The Twins have the last third of their batting order coming up. Swing and a miss on a fastball one and one. Joe uh, Greg Olson. Well Olson as you mentioned he's had a better year this year than last year and Frank Robinson told me before the ball game he was going to pitch tonight because he has not pitched for a couple of days and tomorrow is another off day. Oh, look at that curveball. And Frank Robinson also told me that he has one of the best curveballs he's ever seen. <laughs> well, when he first came up, when they first signed him out of college, they said, well, he's got a Bly Levin curveball. That seems to be the measure. And in this case, he has delivered that. He throws it hard and harder. And throws another one there. Did Sorrento check? I don't think so. They throw to first. What's the call? He, it is a strikeout. Yes, there is one away. Well, you talked about the woes the Orioles have had last this year with bases loaded. Aguilera strikes out the side. He strikes out the hitter here, but he set him up with the pitch before fastball inside on the outside corner. Then he came back with a split finger, and you can see Aguilera's reaction there as he came in with the bases loaded and he struck out the side, striking him out. And leaving the runner at third. Quite a performance by Aguilera. Here is Moses, and that's ball one, the low fastball. Again, the Orioles continue to guard the foul lines. Joe, you're a strategy with which you're uh, in agreement? Well, it depends on the hitter. I, I just think that uh, if a guy percentage wise can pull the ball in the corners, that's okay, but. You don't just do it because it's late in the end, late in the ball game. If a guy can pull the ball, then you guard the line. If he's not a pull hitter, then I don't think you guard the line. But they're sitting right on the line. And I think that's pretty much where the Orioles uh, 
Always do it. Well, Frank Robinson is kind of from the old school, and there's I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way. Finley, the center fielder, in left center for out number two. Moses, one for four. I think there's just an, a matter of opinion of, you know, do you want to do it or not do it? I don't know if there is a definitely a right way and a wrong way. Here's Greg Gagne. He's one for three. Like so many other things in baseball, it's not always just cut and dry that you do something one way. That's what makes managers different. That's what makes players different. They all have their own way of getting, trying to get the same thing accomplished. I remember in the 1987 World Series when the Twins played the Cardinals, and there was talk about Whitey Herzog employing this strategy. He was asked about it, so why did you do that? And they get Todd Worrell on the mound, a hard thrower. And he said, well, I play my defense that way because that's the way we've been doing it in baseball for 100 years. That surprised me about Herzog because Herzog has been an innovator in a lot of different situations. And I've always said that, you know, I didn't necessarily agree that you do things by the book all the time because I didn't read the guy. I didn't know the guy who wrote the book. You know, there are things have changed. Baseball has changed a lot since. 1902 or John McGraw's day, etc. Some people think Whitey wrote it. <laughs> well, he wrote part of it. That's foul and out of play. The count, two balls and a strike to Greg Gagne. Don't forget, after the ball game, we'll be taking you to Sports Center with Robin Roberts and Dan Patrick with uh, all of the highlights of the day in sports. A conversation with Roger Clemens, highlights from the Mets and Reds confrontation at Shea Stadium. A complete baseball wrap up. All the golf and everything in the world of sports. That's up the middle base hit for Gagne. The 12th hit for the Twins. Each team with 12 hits, but just three runs for each club. Well, they have had a lot of scoring opportunities, but as we've seen, only Herbeck delivered for the Twins, getting a three-run homer. And the Orioles have stranded a lot of guys in scoring position tonight. The Orioles have left a grand total of 11 men on base, and the Twins have left nine men on base. Two down, runner at first. That's Greg Gagne. Here's Newman. Now, Olsen is very poor at holding runners close. You can get a great jump against Greg Olsen. Well, not only that, a guy that's his best pitch is a curveball, it's going to be awfully tough for the catcher to throw a guy out because the curveball breaks down and the toughest pitch for a catcher to throw on is the ball low. Catchers like the high fastball to be able to throw out the speedy base runners. And a curveball pitcher doesn't use the high fastball that often. Now Newman's been on base three times. He's had two singles and a walk. Three to three. Last of the eighth. Each team has its closer in the game and each closer is outstanding. Whoa. <laughs> that was really a pitch out. Well, they want they were thinking along with Tom Kelly and trying to figure out when he was going to send Gagne. Melvin jumps outside, but Olsen almost throws it over his head. That's not the way they teach it. No. Gagne has not been very successful at stealing bases either. He's stolen three, but he's been caught five times. And that's outside. Ball two. Two and over the count. Gonzalez still playing right next to the bag at third. This is a perfect hit and run situation if you don't want to send the guy. You can put him in motion and hope that Al Newman hits the ball in the gap someplace and he can score. But it's also not a bad play to send him because if he's thrown out, you got your leadoff hitter leading off the bottom of the ninth to the top of your order. He's not running. Ball three. Gene Larkin is on deck for the Twins. And after Larkin, then you get into Puckett, Gaetti, Herbeck, the big, the big three of the Twins. 3 and 0. Olsen has not pitched in a game since last Wednesday. And he walks him on four pitches. He gives the Twins a man in scoring position free of charge. And now Larkin comes up. I think that's one of the reasons Frank Robinson wanted to pitch him because you know you want your guy out there. You know every couple of days you said he hadn't pitched since Wednesday you want him out there. Just to stay sharp. Um, and the thing that goes first is your control. When you don't go to the mound for a few days if you are a closer. 
Gene Larkin the hitter he is one for four his one hit started a three run Minnesota rally in the fifth inning. Which so far has been the twins only scoring of the game. Two on two out last of the eight to three three tie. Olsen to the plate starts him with a curve for a called strike. There's Gagne he hit a two out single he's at second. And there is Albert D. Newman telling Wayne Terwilliger hey what me worry. <laughs> oh and one the count to Larkin. Kirby Puckett would be next. The Orioles no longer playing the exaggerated defense they're in normal depth now not guarding the foul lines. One strike pitch in the dirt with a curveball. Olsen in his uh, first go round in September of 88 just a couple of months out of college gave up a home run to Steve Balboni. Since that time he's faced more than 550 major league batters. And nobody has hit a home run against him in that time except a fellow named Dwight Evans of Boston. He's done it twice. But eight days ago in Boston he beat Olsen with a two run homer in the last of the ten. The one one pitch very high and Olsen looking none too sharp here Joe. Well again it could be the layoff. And that's why Robinson was concerned. Uh, Al Jackson's going to come out and talk to him. You know if you're a hitter in this situation Gene Larkin. You have to think about what is Greg Olson's best pitch. And his best pitch is his curveball. So you have to figure that two out of every three pitchers you're going to see the curveball. He's not going to get beat with his second or third best pitch by throwing you a fastball in the middle of the plate. He figures that if he throws the curveball even if it's in the middle of the plate he still has a chance to fool you with the speed or the break of the pitch. So if you're Larkin or if I'm Larkin in this situation I would have been looking for the curveball the first pitch which he got and I would still be looking for the curveball right now two and one. Sunday night baseball from the Metrodome. We're in the last of the eighth inning in a tie ball game. Three to three. Baltimore and Minnesota. The Twins with two men on, two men out. And the two ball, one strike pitch to Larkin is on the way. Fastball foul back to the screen. See, I would have two and two now. <laughs> well, that looked like a high fastball. I probably wouldn't have swung at it anyway, but I definitely would not have been looking fastball in that situation. But see with two strikes you can't look for a pitch anymore. Now you have to hit what you see. olsen has got the good enough fastball 91 92 miles an hour. And that great curveball if he's getting them over he can be devastating. 2 2 pitch. There's the curve but it's in the dirt. Breaking for third is Gagne and he'll make it easily. Holding at first was Newman. Well he goes with his best pitch but he he's overthrowing the curveball he's trying to throw it too hard. He's trying to make a sharp curveball he wants to get the strike out and he throws a 60 foot curveball instead of the 60 foot six inch job and there you go bounces in front and there's nothing Melvin can do as gag and he goes over to third base. Now if he throws that same kind of a pitch the go ahead run could score runner is at first and third two down. There goes Newman from first. Strike three called to Gene Larkin. Olsen gets him looking, and Puckett has to head out to the outfield. He'll bat leading off in the ninth. We go to the ninth inning. Milligan, Tettle, and Norselak coming up. 3 3. We're indoors at the Metrodome in Minneapolis, and Sunday night baseball. We're heading right into the ninth inning. Each team with three runs and 12 hits in this game and lots of chances Joe. Well if you're the hitter he's thrown you three curveballs and missed with all three you have to sit on the fastball three two you have to look for the fastball and try to adjust to the curve. You cannot look for a curveball and hit a 90 plus mile an hour fastball and you can't take strike three in that situation with the winning runner on base. Here's Randy Milligan. Now the Orioles had their three four and five hitters coming up in this inning. Milligan Tentelin and Orsalak. Milligan one for three with a walk. Facing Rick Aguilera. Both out of the Mets organization. That's a called strike, one and one. Milligan has only faced Aguilera a couple of times and had a single against him in two trips. Of the two pitchers who are closers and who will probably pitch an inning, one more inning apiece at least, 
Aguilera is the sharpest at this particular time. He has all of his pitches working. The good fastball, the split finger, and the slider. And right now, Olsen, that last inning at least, he was struggling with his curveball. Olsen's been in and out with his curveball the last two, three weeks. Some, some games he's got the good one. Other games it's not been there for him. And for instance, when Evans hit the game winning home run eight days ago in Boston, he did not have the curveball. That's the difference. Evan is a smart hitter. I mean, he knows if the guy can't get his curveball over, what is he going to throw me? Uh, some guys continue to look for the curveball, even though if he gets it over, they're not going to hit it anyway. Well, that's a good point. I mean, Larkin, if, yeah. if Olsen snapped off a beauty, he's not going to hit it. He's not going to hit it anyway. That's the point. You know, I, I learned that from Rusty Staub a long time ago. He said, don't look for something you can't hit. <laughs> so I agree with that. Pitch on the way is slider in the dirt. Two and two to Milligan. But I would see why Dwight Evans, you know, being a smart hitter and a veteran knowing, you know, pitching patterns. If a guy can't get a pitch over, you have to look for the other pitch. Now, in the last of this ninth inning, the Twins will also have their three, four, and five hitters up. 2 2 pitch, rounded foul. So the Orioles will be well advised to get a run here because when you've got Puckett, Herbeck, and Gaetti coming up, and Olsen's not looking all that sharp, better to have a little bit of a cushion here. Two and two to Milligan. Twins guarding the foul lines against Randy. Pitch on the way. Ball three. In the Baltimore bullpen, Jeff Ballard. He was their biggest winner last year, the left-hander. This year, only one and nine. There's Jeff. And now in the bullpen, they're going to go with four men in the rotation at least until the All-Star break. He was nine and one at this time last year, and he's turned it around. He's, one and nine. He started nine and one. Yeah. Strike three. Call the Milligan. Well, that low pitch has been called a strike time after time in this ball game. Well, as you mentioned, they're calling the low pitch, so if you're the hitter, you have to swing at it. Here's a 3-2 pitch. And but it goes back to something you said at the beginning of the ball game. You know, you've got Milligan and a few guys who draw bases on balls. There are times when a base on balls is okay, and maybe this is one of those times. But you also have a guy that can hit the ball out of the ballpark, Milligan. And you're on the road. You swing the bat. Or I should say you have to be more aggressive. But I'm sure he thought the pitch was low. So Milligan is down. And here's Tedlin, one for four. He struck out two straight times. Aguilera has struck out everybody that he's retired in this game. He's gotten four outs all on strikes. Ball two, two and oh. And there it is, an inning in the third. That one walk was an intentional one. Remember when he came in. There were runners at first and third, and there was nobody out. And then, as he struck out Melvin, Nixon stole second. He had second and third and one out, and he struck out Walker. And then, with the bases loaded after the intentional walk, he struck out Hewlett. Quite a performance. Three and oh now to Tendleton. He seems to be very cautious here with the left handed power hitter and the short porch in right field. Well, you've got. Tettleton and Milligan and Orselak, all those guys can hit the ball out of the ballpark. So you have to be careful with them. You do not want to get a pitch in the zone that they can jerk the ball. The outfield is very deep all the way around, as you would expect this time of the game. 3-3, three, three, ninth inning. The pitch, very high. He wanted nothing to do with Mickey Tettleton there. He'll start over with a fresh count against Joe Orselak. Orselak is two for four. His double in the eighth inning. Off the canvas in right field started the rally in the eighth that tied the ball game. Here's Orsola. He's the one guy in this Orioles club who's really had a long history against Aguilera. Orsola formerly in the National League with the Pirates. He's faced him a lot, but a lot of the time Aguilera prevailed. Orsola five hits in 22 lifetime at bats against Aguilera. Big hole on the right side of the infield. Herbeck is going to hold Tettleton on the bag. One out. Foul ball. 3-3, three, three, ninth inning. We're here right till the end and right after 
We'll go to Sports Center coming up right after the ball game. John, I have a theory on that. You know, computer printouts about what a guy is hitting against another guy. See, I don't think those printouts have any meaning until you get about 20 at bats against the guy because. You know your first couple of at bats you could be swinging the bat poorly and the guy just gets you out or you could be hot and the guy you get some base hits so until you get about 20 at bats I don't think those computer printouts have a lot of meaning. I mean you only face the guy one time you get a base hit you know you're not going to hit a thousand off of him but you did at that particular time but I think that once you get up around 20 at bats as Orsalak has against Aguilera I think that's a better reading. Oh, and two the count to Orsalak. The pitch is the split finger, but it's way outside. One and two the count. Well, it's a tool that managers right. have at their disposal and maybe right. get a line on maybe a little edge in a certain spot. Well, I think it's I don't I think it's a guide that you can use. I don't miss, you know, I don't say it's not uh, important, but it's a guide more than a determining factor as far as I'm concerned. One two pitch, and he just got a piece of it. Orsalak's tough to strike out. 3 3 ninth inning. Big crowd at the Metrodome. Twins trying to get the month of July started on, on an up note after a miserable June. The Orioles trying to climb back into the pennant race in the American League East, where you can struggle for two, three weeks and still get hot and get right back into it. Although the Red Sox won today, and so did the Blue Jays, the top two teams in the division. One out, Tantalin at first. One and two to Joe Orsola. And it's ball two. Orsalak's a kind of a, a manager's dream player. He plays all around the outfield. He plays hard. He works at the game. And of course he's a good hitter, but if you sit him out for a few days, you say you're a role player, you're a platoon player. Orsalak says, well, just tell me what you want from me, and that's what I'll go do. Never complains. Well, show me a guy that's happy to be in the big leagues, and he'll usually do what the team wants him to do. Two and two the count. Aguilera tries it again against Orsalak. Struck him out. Well, Aguilera has had the good fastball all night, and with two strikes, if you're the hitter Orsalak, you have to protect against the split finger, and if you wait a split second too long, the fastball's right by you. And this is what Aguilera does. Good fastball, good motion. He hides the ball pretty well. You don't pick it up until he releases it. So that leaves it to Cal Ripken. And Cal has gone three for four tonight with a homer and a, and two runs batted in. He drove in the tying run with a single in the eighth. Strike one. By the way, Cal has not committed an error tonight as he tries to set the all-time record for most consecutive errorless games by a shortstop in a single season. That's a fly ball to left, but it looks routine for Moses. And the Twins will have the big sluggers coming up. Puckett, Herbeck, and Gaetti. We go to the last of the ninth inning. It's still tied. Baltimore three, Minnesota three. The Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome is the scene, and the Minnesota Twins now are sending up the big hitters against Greg Olson to try and win this one. Last of the ninth inning. It's the Baltimore Orioles three, the Minnesota Twins three. Cal Ripken hoping that he'll have to go extra innings to get that all time consecutive errorless game record. Kirby Puckett, he's got plenty of fans here as he tries to get the Twins started. He is three for four. Olsen on the mound for the Orioles delivers. Curveball, ball one. And again, you pointed it out earlier, Joe. Having problems getting that pitch over. That's his big pitch. And see, a guy like Puckett, the smart hitter, will sit on the fastball right here at this particular pitch. There's a fastball, but it's outside. 2 0 the count. The outfield is very deep. The infield is all spread out, protecting the foul lines. 
And if you're the hitter, you got him 2 0, you have to sit on the fastball now. Again, until he throws the curveball for a strike. 2 0 delivery. Ball three. You know, one problem for Olsen now, but he's not getting the curveball over. As you see, shades of the 87 playoffs and World Series, they're waving those homer hankies again here at the Metrodome. Olsen has had more problems getting his fastball over historically than his curveball. Gets that one over. Three and one to Kirby Puckett. But see, it's still a fastball situation for Puckett. And Puckett has proven through the years that if he wants to go for power, he can. And this is a power situation. The three one fastball. And he walks. A leadoff walk to Kirby Puckett, and now Herbeck comes up. Well, we know this guy can go deep at any time. He went deep in the fifth inning, a three run homer. We'll see here again. Olsen is walking that same tightrope that Harnish was walking because if you become a one pitch pitcher against good hitters, they're going to hit you. I mean, if he has to throw fastballs to throw strikes, Herbeck and Gaetti, these guys are going to hit him. He needs his curveball in order to be successful through the middle of this lineup. Curveball, there's a strike. Right, he needed that pitch for a strike. What is it? But you can't control a pitch all of a sudden. Is it the grip? What is it? Well, a lot of times you lose your rhythm. I think he was trying to throw it too hard. That was not a real hard curveball there. That was a good curveball. The other ones, I think he was just overthrowing them, trying to make them break too sharply. That one broke sharply and into the dirt. Right. See, if, if you overthrow it, it's going to break sharp, but if the hitter doesn't chase it, it's going to be a ball. Is that Olsen then trying to make the perfect pitch? Well, I think he is because you're looking at guys who can really hurt him. But see, he's got a position now. He can throw the fastball if he gets it in on his hands or gets it in the right spot. But if he was behind in the count, he couldn't throw him the fastball. The 1-1 one -one pitch. Curveball swung out and missed. That one dropped out of sight. Again, that was a ball, though. It was not a strike. And because he had one strike on him, he chased it a little bit. Herbeck looking fastball there. I think he probably was. But see, also what happens is if you're a good curveball pitcher and you're ahead in the count or even, they will swing at that pitch. If they're behind, if you're behind in the count, they're not going to chase that curveball breaking in the dirt. Now it's one and two. Here it comes. Another curveball, and he just got a piece of it. A ball and two strikes. And that was a great curveball right there. I mean, that ball exploded when it got to the plate. Greg Olson, he's had 15 saves and 17 chances. His ERA 1.13. 40 innings, only 23 hits allowed. 38 strikeouts, 13 walks. He's had two strikeouts in this game. Puckett back to first. Well, they want to make sure that Puckett doesn't steal second base while he's concentrating on Herbert. But there's always the danger when you're throwing that good curveball that it's going to bounce, and that would allow Puckett to go to second base anyway. Baltimore three, Minnesota three, last of the ninth. Nobody out. The one two pitch. Fastball, line drive, base hit, right center field. Puckett to second, and he'll hold there as Cummins grabs the ball and throws into Ripken. He must have thought Herbeck was thinking curve. No, I, what happened there is Greg Olson shook twice. He said yes to the fastball, and he said yes again to the location. See, I knew he was going to throw a fastball because he did that. And I'm Ken Herbeck, if I know it, maybe he knows it too. See, if you first you say yes, that means okay to the pitch, and you say yes again to the location. That's what he did. And if you say yes once, Usually that means okay you can throw the curveball or the fastball you don't throw it to a spot but when you say yes twice it's also setting up location and you only try to locate the fastball you don't just throw the fastball over the plate you just try to throw a strike with the curveball. Will yeah. they bunt is the question here I think it's a bunting situation but I'm not Tom Kelly. Ball on that curveball slipped out of his hand well on the other hand guy Eddie is your man. He's right. been doing it for years. But he also, a, a ground ball here could be devastating because it gets you out of the inning. But also, now that he's missed with the breaking ball, I think you have to 
assume that the count goes to Gaetti's favor. And Gaetti is two for four. Lifetime off of Olsen. Bucket at second, Herbeck at first. Olsen not looking very sharp. Here's the pitch. Again, he can't get the curveball over. He's missed badly twice here. Right. Now, he, as you see, the third base coach, Rennick, saying, hey, sit on the fastball in the middle of the plate. That's what that sign means. Make it be right there. And, of course, this is a fastball situation. And if it's not, Gaetti should take the pitch. And Carroll's got it to Hewlett one, and he'll be content with that. Cal Ripken has saved the game at least for the moment. Well he got the fastball and he hit it hard but you can't guide the baseball and it's a great play by Ripken to keep the game going. This is Ripken isolated he gets ready for the pitch watch him take his hop right there that lets you take your movement where you want to go and they can only get one force out now you see Hewlett he takes a look over at Puckett who's going to third base. Ooh. Nice play. He hit his chin right in the turf there. Now there's Puckett. He's the possible winning run, and he's at third with only one man out. Gaetti, the runner at first, not so important, except that because he's still at first, they can get a double play and end this inning. And here's Harper. And they'd like to get the ground ball from him. Olsen to the plate. Curveball. It is a foul ball. In a lot of cases, managers would walk the guy to load the bases so they can try to get a double play to get out of the inning. But if you go ahead and walk Harper, you've got a left-handed hitter coming up, Paul Sorrento. So Robinson is choosing to try to get Brian Harper out and then maybe walk Sorrento. But he's definitely not walking the right-hander to load the bases to pitch to the left-hander. But a lot of managers would do that. Cal Ripken at short, Tim Hewlett at second, double play depth. The one strike delivery. Blocked in the dirt by Melvin. Ball one. Look at those hit totals. 25 hits in the game, only six runs. We've had so many situations very much like this. Well, the Twins are even worse because the only runs they've scored have come on a home run by Herbert. So no one else has been able to hit. In this situation, Harper trying to bring Bucket home, and he's done it. Base hit. The ball game is over, and the Twins have won it. Brian Harper with the single. Twins have won four to three in the ninth. Well, what Harper did was great. He looked for the curveball, he got it, and he lined it in the center field. And Cal Ripken on that same play has set the all time consecutive errorless uh, streak at shortstop. It's not the way he wanted it to happen. Well, I guarantee he's not thinking about that right now. But there you see uh, some of his teammates who are concerned coming over saying congratulations. And that's the one thing about a team. You are pulling for your teammates to do well. Brian Harper did well tonight, and the Minnesota Twins come up with a run in the bottom of the night to win it. So it's a new month and Tom Kelly and his ball club hoping that tonight is uh, what they're going to be seeing a lot more of in July. For the Orioles the struggle continues. Olsen has an off night. We'll see you next Sunday in Cleveland the world champion A's and the Indians 8 o'clock Eastern. Now John Miller for Joe Morgan saying stay tuned for Sports Center next.